Hey everybody, welcome to Mark Bell's Power Project Podcast. Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Free Sleeve. And Seema, do you remember an archaic day before we ever used Free Sleeve? Yeah, man. I remember like coming home after rough sessions in terms of the gym, it was really annoying because like after a few hours, if my elbows would still be a little bit achy or if my knee would be acting up, I'd have to put some ice into a plastic bag, put some paper towel over it because it would leak all over me. And then I'd have to put it on my joint. And then also for some reason, it just stings. Like I felt like a little, I'm not going to say it. I just felt so weak because I would put it on and then it would sting and I'd have to leave it on for like maybe 15 minutes. It was difficult. But then when we were able to get the free sleeve, I just like slide it on. It feels great to move around in. It doesn't sting, but you can tell you're getting a really nice cold compress that's consistent because when you're putting an ice bag on your elbow, you kind of get lazy. You're watching TV. It falls off a little bit. Then you got to put it right back. You got to pay attention to it. With the free sleeve, you put it on, you forget it's there, and then you remember it's there 15 minutes later and take it off. Yeah, and what I love is like a traditional ice pack, like by the time it's done, like being totally frozen and it's malleable, it's not cold anymore. Mm. This one, free sleeve, you just throw it on. Like you said, you put it on, you forget about it, next thing you know, you feel better. Uh, you guys need to upgrade your ice packs today by heading over to freesleeve.com. At checkout, enter promo code POWER25 for 25% off and free shipping on all domestic orders. <laughs> Damn, four counts? Right? That's how you're going to do it to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just got here. <laughs> fucking it's good. easy when he's on the other side of the table and like he's, you know, he's got the headphones on. Like, listen. And he's I'm got it. I'm not Chad Wesley right? Smith, man. I'm coming for your ankles, man. <laughs> and he's got, a, he's got an injury over there. Yeah, you're killing me. Can't do much right now. Dude, what happened? So last year, December, I ended up tearing my ACL. I talked about that. But I was in jiu-jitsu. And getting out of a position, pretty much, it was a it was De La Hiva guard. And so what I did was I tried to push the guy's leg down and try to turn my knee out. What ended up happening was my knee was stuck underneath his butt. So it was, it was in external torque. I went to turn, rotate, heard the pop. And I was like, damn, here we go. So I knew there was a long process. But the problem was is that I had Yoani and Jacek, Dustin Poirier fighting like two months later. So I knew but I couldn't get surgery then. We saw you like, I think, like right around the time you got hurt, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually I came here in November <clears throat> and we did a podcast and then in January we did a podcast in LA. And so right after that. Mm -hmm. So I was traveling, this and that. And then I got the surgery booked and then all of a sudden COVID hit. So now, you know, non-emergency surgeries were, and I literally was like the week I was going to get the surgery. They were like, we have to cancel it. So I'm like, damn, all right. So after that, you know, I was waiting, waiting, waiting. Finally, I was just like, all right, man, I'm, I'm gonna figure it out later on. And uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Abbasi, he was a UFC cage side doctor, came to my gym just to see the gym. And he walked into the gym and I was like, hey man, you know what? I have an ACL tear, I need to get it fixed. So we set it up, finally got it done. And uh, now I'm six weeks out from surgery. So got the full ACL rupture. And then I had a slight meniscus tear because I was oh, walking shit. on it for a year almost. But we're slowly getting back. I feel like I'm progressing faster than usual. They say I'm, I'm like roughly about a month ahead of time. So I'm about two weeks to three weeks out from doing some plyometric drills, which is really like the end all. So once I can get to get to that, then we'll be good to go you have somebody helping you with like programming for it? I mean, I know that you know a ton about it, but yeah. um, it might make sense to have someone else kind of take that over just so you're not, mm -hmm. uh, just so you don't have to think about it. Yeah. Have young, you done that? Or? Yep, yep. Uh, I got a young lady by the name of Dr. Christiana Marin, who's out of Fort Lauderdale. And uh, she works with a lot of my fighters, works with a lot of Miami Dolphins players, NFL players. And uh, so we have came, came together and just formulated the program based off of what I need. The good thing is that she knows what I know. And the great thing is that we can converse together. I don't need to go there every day. I go there once a week. And honestly, it's a lot more of like soft tissue release just for blood flow and just to get everything working properly, right? And a lot of times people, they neglect that and they don't do the proper, they don't produce what they need to because they just stay still, right? Mm -hmm. The goal for me, as soon as I got out of the hospital, was quad sets, right? To increase the ability to contract my quads, straighten out my leg as much as I can, and then work on flexion and extension every day, pretty much. So I would say right after I got out, I started doing it. And then, you know, they put a nerve block in, so I couldn't bear weight on it. 
which was an issue, but I would say about two to three days after, I was able to ditch the crutches, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. and as soon as I had feeling in it, I started walking on it. So now we're in, like I said, six weeks out, I'm feeling pretty good. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of, uh, especially grapplers, got Josh over here, um, a lot of grapplers are really scared of that injury because like, yeah. not just not just for the way it happened to you, but like heel hooks, all that nasty crap. Like yeah. ACLs just go. Yeah. Um, so with that being said, I saw you doing a lot of different type of stuff that I've never seen before on your mm -hmm. Instagram to strengthen that. Mm -hmm. Like what are some like simple things that grapplers should be maybe adding in or athletes should be adding in to help strengthen that or yeah. make sure it's I mean move. a lot of it is going to be strengthening up the surrounding muscle right okay. so you got to strengthen up the hamstrings quadriceps making sure your glutes and your hips are locked in strain strong mm -hmm. you know that's a lot, that's that's the issue is the reason why I didn't tear it like and weren't able to come back as as fast as I did was because of the fact that again my hamstrings were strong so a lot of guys don't have that ability or don't really work the hamstrings so i think the hamstrings that have the quadriceps worked on efficiently you'll be good to go also making sure that your feet are strong right and stability in your feet the support system is going to definitely help you there when i when i got it torn and i knew that it was going to be a process i started working on it before i got surgery so mm -hmm. there was a large amount of time there where i could prehab and work on stability and work on things from a unilateral perspective so I can strengthen up the surrounding tissue. So you brought some muscle with you this time around, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what happened? Did we intimidate you too much? Did not. Nah, well, had to bring a leg breaker I with did you? I had to bring, yeah, she, she's definitely uh, my bodyguard in a sense, right? So this is Maureen Shea. She's a two-time world champion boxer. I've been working with her for four years now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and we are in the process of getting this title, yeah. one more title back. So it's gonna be, gonna be good. Maureen, you wanna talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, I mean, um, I've been boxing a long time and, um, you know, it was just amazing for me. And like I said to you earlier, uh, a lot of boxers have this, a lot of trainers have the old school mentality of strength and conditioning. And, you know, I always loved lifting. I always loved moving weight. My brother was a bodybuilder. My brother did powerlifting and I always looked up to him. He's 10 years older than me. And I always wanted to lift. And I always felt like this empowerment with the lifting that I felt equally with the boxing. But it was just not really you know accepted in the boxing and you can't you know you can't lift heavy weight you're gonna get slow like all those things and i love that phil did uh, he did a piece on his channel about like how to lift you know what i'm saying and, and that it doesn't make you slow lifting slow weights slow makes you slow you know or heavy weight slow you know we're doing it with a purpose and functional functional movement and um you know so when i when i linked up with phil i was like this is like my dream you know this is like everything that i've ever wanted to do and understanding um injury prevention understanding functional movement understanding the explosive power and you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older now, and I'm like, man, you put me in there with a 20-year-old, a 25-year-old, I'm ready to go. Mature muscle, um, emotional maturity, you know, just um, overall, I'm, I feel now probably the most well-rounded fighter I've ever felt in my life. And then, you know, some tricks of the trade, too. Yeah. Just you know, some shit to kind of hurt people a little bit. Just, so they, <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, just so those, those youngsters, you slow them down a little bit. Yep, yep. Do you think uh, that, you know, in some of your training with, uh, with Phil, do you feel like, um, you know, implementing some of that explosiveness uh, has made a huge difference to help you become more explosive or were you kind of explosive to begin with? No, I'm definitely, it's made, made a huge difference. It's more effective. You know what I mean? I feel like now I have a purpose to it. I understand the control of my body. I think that was probably the biggest thing is developing um, the, the muscle and then understanding how to use it and when to use it. And also, you know, it's, you know, boxing, like I told you before, it's two minute rounds, but I need to know when to distribute that, when to not, when to do just like volume and then when to be, you know, sit on my punches and really crack um, to, to cause the damage, you know, so it definitely helped me a lot. And just being being uh, self body awareness. I think that's another part. A lot of the things you saw in the video, you know, warming up and things like that and being in that controlled state and having to hold my leg and be there. Um, working those little muscles, those stabilizer muscles and understanding what their purpose is. And the other thing with Phil that I love, it's not just, oh, I'm just not like just this body in there moving. I'm, I'm getting an education. I want to understand. And, and I don't know if it's just being a female, but I find that working with females, um, you know, I, I, I coach it too, that we, if we understand, we're able to apply better. So him teaching and the way that he explains it, I understand it. And then I'm like, oh, okay. So when I'm doing this in the, in the weight room, I know exactly how this translates to the ring. Mm -hmm. And then I can apply it, and it's more effective. Do you guys feel? Do you guys feel that uh, if you know if someone is um, if someone's already explosive, 
that maybe the way that they lift maybe doesn't matter quite as much or um, what are some of your thoughts on that because yeah. you know sometimes people will say oh you know if you if you lift heavy it might slow you down but if yeah. someone's already explosive maybe it doesn't matter quite the same way yeah i'm looking at it as where's their strengths where their weaknesses are right so if i got a i got a kid a young kid his name's uh trap francis kid is super explosive right undefeated how many knockouts does he have now I think six, six. Or seven. yeah he's he's gonna be a world champion yeah he's phenomenal. multiple times mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so for me i gotta slow him down right because he hurts himself his mm -hmm. body isn't strong enough to withstand the the amount of velocity that he produces so he has a lot of those nagging injuries because of it so i have to slow him down and work on isometrics or some quasi isometrics working on strength development really than anything with her it was more she had she had a good strength base but it was increasing her awareness like she talked about and then increasing the stability and the movement quality. Because now I can see it when she's hitting pads, when she's in the ring, she's moving more efficiently, she's distributing her weight a lot more efficiently because she knows how to move and that's good. When I have a guy like uh, like uh, Jake, mm -hmm. right? Now Jake is very explosive, but he's strong too. Mm -hmm. So now, okay, what do I gotta do? I'm looking at where the weaknesses lie. So his conditioning needs to be brought up. So now we work on the conditioning, whether it be local muscular endurance, cardiac output, increasing aerobic capacity whatever we need to do to get him ready to go for that particular fight now he's fighting bare knuckle mm -hmm. so it's two minute rounds right wait bare knuckle yeah you don't know bare knuckle is? <laughs> come on man you gotta That's get with boxing it started you gotta get with it man the but queensberry they, rules Queensberry rules they still have those fights though like well, but, oh it's it was well, it came back yeah, yeah. It just well they came started back a around. league yeah they started mm -hmm. they started a league and um very it, bloody they have a few, but you know. Damn. Well, it also probably never went anywhere, really, right? Like, it, it probably has been around forever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's around. They're yeah, marketing in, in it the more streets, now. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now they actually have rules and they have it. They kind of put some, uh, some, uh, you know, some pizzazz behind it. And now everybody's like, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I honestly didn't think it was going to go anywhere, but it's looking like it's taken off. So we'll see. And they said, you know, obviously there's, there's, it's a lot more bloodier. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more cuts, lacerations that. Are they wearing like, anything on their hands or is it just no, they, uh, they have, wrap, so, wrapped up? So they do have like a, a type of, of, I don't I want to say like, it's not a glove. It's like a padding that protects um, the smaller bones. Mm -hmm. And then there's the wrap and then there's, you know, the tape and everything. Um, the thing <laughs> that they started in is really interesting. David Feldman, actually his father uh, was a boxing trainer who trained um, seven, seven world champions. Oh. And uh, so he, he said, you know, I wanted to do this, you know, the Queensbury rules, if anybody knows them, you know, the gloves were put on the hands of the fighter to protect the hands of the fighter, not the head of the opponent. Mm -hmm. And so there's actually less concussions. This is what they're stating um, with, with proof. And there's articles out there that there's less concussions and less, less injury uh, to the brain mm -hmm. in this because when they get hit, they go out. And it's a similar thing with MMA, with the smaller gloves. There's more deaths in boxing and, and brain mm -hmm. injuries in boxing because of the repetitive yeah. punches to the head. Yeah, so I here, understand. the big yeah. thing here is they say uh, broken hands, uh, broken hand, and uh, and the cuts. Yeah. And they say they they have, I mean, they have a great, they have physicians there that take care of the guys and and the girls. There's females that are doing it too, but it's um it's definitely starting to acquire a style of its own. Um, I I feel um I actually I manage Jake Boswick for for this, and I feel like he's gonna fight in November. And I feel like he, when I first saw this, and I, I met with David Feldman about it, I was this is perfect for Jake. You know, because he's now learning how to move his head. He's learning how to, you know, that cardio, that, that endurance. Like, he looks like a bare knuckle fighter. He's perfect. Just and like he's just the marketing around him. From like mm -hmm. head to toe. His from personality. London. Yeah. It's perfect. It yeah. makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, professional football, you know, they, they've talked about like what to do about the concussions. And mm -hmm. they, they can't really go backwards at this point. They can't like take the pads back off. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that could be something that would help is to actually have less equipment, not more equipment. Because mm -hmm. the more mm -hmm. equipment that you have on, the less regard you have for your body and you're exactly. just gonna come flying in and yeah. charge in and it, like you said it'll be very repetitive mm -hmm. yep. and that's what we're seeing uh, in boxing and some other sports mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. does this tend to like be a little faster because it looks super erratic is that just because the actual fighters you see there because like when well, you're watching a box those match, two fighters are, are very aggressive two fighters yeah. but, okay you know sometimes i mean you you're gonna see them let off on each other no no doubt mm -hmm. right but uh but yeah it's it's a close it's a smaller kit it's, it's well i mean it's it's round first of all they can't play off the ropes i don't know mm -hmm. if um you guys know who Poli Malignaggi is you know Poli Malignaggi was a multi-time yeah. world champion in boxing I mm -hmm. you know he trained from Brooklyn you know he's actually a friend of mine he fought Artem Lobov who's an MMA fighter who was just on there with the ball oh, yeah, was, yeah it was Artem so when you saw Artem come out where MMA fighters are a little bit more um you know wild mm -hmm. um where Pauly was like more strategic with watch his punches watch what you say watch what you say well no, no well the striking <laughs> listen all right 
<laughs> um, but yeah, so that was the fight, and and Paulie, uh, you know, came out trying to like keep him away with the jab, you know, uh, movement, trying to be a little bit more strategic. Where Arden was a little bit more um, coming in, and uh, I don't want to say reckless, but it was, it was like it was a little bit reckless and a little bit like you know whatever shot he could land. You see how Paulie jumps back; he's trying to throw the jab, trying to get in, get out. Cause whatever damage he can, and Artem's trying to get him because oh. Artem's more comfortable in the clinch. Mm. So the, the with the rules here with bare knuckle FC, you're allowed to grab behind the head. So grabbing behind the head and throwing the punches. Now a boxer is never comfortable in that position, mm. and it's illegal in boxing. And so Paul, that's Paul why is, Paul is also more of a tactician. Than yes, he's a boxer. He's not a, really a puncher. So you um, get to use your fingers and hands a little bit because you don't have a glove. Right, well, yeah, so you can holding. kind of grab the guy a little bit uh, behind the head, yeah, you behind can, the head, it's like and dirty you can boxing. strike. Dirty yeah. boxing for sure. There's no on the elbow or on the waist or anything. It's more behind the head. But in this fight in particular, he knew Artem knew that Paulie was not comfortable inside. Mm -hmm. So if you see Paulie using his feints, using his bounces, using his timing, which a boxer is going to do more of, um, an MMA fighter is more comfortable on the inside because they know they can do it for the takedown or. Mm -hmm. But they also have to be careful because they're used to getting the knees, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's really interesting. Man, when they make contact with each other, <laughs> every single time they're feeling it, you, know, oh, you, yeah. can, you can tell it looks a lot different than. Definitely than, unforgiving. Yeah, it looks a lot <laughs> different than boxing. Yeah, yeah the thing with uh, one of our fighters, like we talked about with Jake, is that he's he's super aggressive, super mm -hmm. aggressive. I took him. I've cornered him for three fights and every fight is super aggressive. So this should play to. <laughs> what he does is play to his strengths so mm -hmm. we'll see as far as like strength and conditioning is concerned it's like i feel like you know you're a little bit older of an ox right now but you said you're you know you're killing young cats because mm -hmm. and, and i feel like it's probably just because strength conditioning is i don't know more people are utilizing it more as athletes yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and I, i'm just wondering how do you feel about that because you see a guy like lebron james 35 years old mm -hmm. just winning another championship looking like he's again 25 yeah. you're killing it mm -hmm. um how do you guys feel it's making a difference for for older athletes well i feel for me a lot of it is more um you know I'm, I'm, i've been in my body for a long time mm -hmm. and i kind of understand that and now i think injury prevention for sure and then also just being able to trust my movement and trust more of that, like, uh, you know, sitting on my punches more. My legs are there. They carry me throughout the whole fight because now I have the development in my legs and the strength to be able to have the stability. Um, so I think that that's been huge for me. Um, and it's good for the mind. I think mentally it's been huge because, I mean, there's only so much boxing you can do, you know, and especially like I said, I've been doing it for 15 years as a professional. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, I'm, I can always sharpen my skills and learning something here and there, but I'm pretty much already you know, teaching old dog new tricks. You know, it, it's a little bit hard. So for me, I enjoy sometimes I need a break from the boxing and I enjoy being in the weight room and I enjoy um, I can visualize what I'm going to do in the boxing, but I'm applying it in the weight room. So I think mentally it's, it's a good break, too, for the athlete to not always be, you know, like LeBron, always be on, on the court. Mm -hmm. You because know, it gets monotonous when you've been doing it for so long and you're so good at what you do. Yeah. You know, so but in, in I think for me too, also setting the goals in the weight room, you know, if I have if I don't have a fight coming up, I know I can always be in the weight room bettering my body and strengthening my body for when that camp starts. Mm -hmm. And then um, you know, I'm able to still stay in that mind state of setting those small goals and achieving. Because I think any elite athlete needs to have those small goals. You know, like I told you before, you know, you're not going to keep a, a fighter. A lot of fighters after a fight, they want to go back to the gym or they're like, oh, I'm right, especially after a win. You know, and then a lot of trainers have been like, no, you need a break. You need to stay home. It's like, why would you do that? <laughs> you know, they need to exercise this. It's more the mind than the body, mm -hmm. you know, so being able to go into the, the weight room with Phil and doing some like, restorative work, but still feeling like I'm achieving those goals, you know, has been really helpful mentally. So I think that's a big part of it as well that people don't really talk about. Mm -hmm. I think just uh, learning how to flex your muscles is like so massively important and it's not it's not really ever talked about and i think when it comes to uh you know kind of sports specific type training or some of the drills that we see that you guys are doing i mean that's really what it's teaching you essentially mm -hmm. uh i went through a, a posing session yesterday we, we had a bodybuilder in the house and he was showing me some stuff and i i'm very green i don't know how to do it very well so mm -hmm. uh to try to keep everything like flexed all at the same time you know it's like oh you know get your get your calves and you're like okay calves okay you got that part and then mm -hmm. it's like okay flex your your quad you know and then yeah. it's like try to do like a double bicep and then try to hold it and then and you know, try to yeah <laughs> try to squeeze it yeah, smile too yeah try to <laughs> yeah. Yeah. try to look jacked and then yeah. try to yeah. you know also not look like you're shitting your pants yeah. you know like <laughs> kind of you got all these things That's going on at one time and you like let off one muscle and you kind of forget yeah. uh, 
Um, but I found that just even with um, just learning how to flex from the time I was a kid, just in you know flexing your biceps and stuff, that's been really beneficial and it had a great carryover into mm-hmm. you know when I did a curl, then it would be more effective. Yeah. If I learned how to flex my chest and learn how to flex my back, True. it made it a lot more effective when I went to do a bench press. Mm-hmm. And so I think that it's it's interesting because someone's like, hey, I'm going to teach you how to run. Mm. That they never really talk about. Hey, this is how you flex your hamstring, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's like, why? How come we're not starting there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's intermuscular coordination. So it's like the starting point of what we want to do, right? We want to make sure that they have that balance, that coordination, um, the ability to contract and relax too is very important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like with the fighters, they need to have that ability to have that rate of force development put in, and the baseline of it all would be again being able to contract first. So we start them off like that, and then we can enhance their ability to relax, be movable, you know, be mobile, and then contract on on demand, which is really good. And I, I think that that's one of the things. It's funny that you talk about that because I know for me with my deadlift, like my lats. I mean, when I'm boxing, I'm relaxed. You know, I only turn it on for a second. Yeah. So to have to stay in that position of keeping my lats on, I noticed even with my bench, I would always lose my lats because I'm always rounding forward. So mm-hmm. by strengthening my posterior chain and being aware of having my lats on, you know, even um, with, with my punches, you know, it really helps because we have to know, like like I said, when to contract and when to relax. But if you don't know how to contract, then what's the point? You could maybe have better posture oh, yeah. Yeah. as you're Overall. standing mm-hmm. and just boxing in mm-hmm. the different positions that you get into, period, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you get dysfunctional patterns built in through fighting, unfortunately. So we have to make sure we balance out the body accordingly. And that's why like, I put a huge emphasis on posterior chain development, making sure that they're balanced out not taking away from their game right you got to ride that fine line but again still making sure that they are appropriately working on the things that they need to especially from a muscular standpoint and a lot of it's going to be coming from the hamstrings the glutes the lats everything there because again you're going to balance out the body up more maureen has some of this uh, surprised you like where you started training with phil and you're like holy fuck like 100 like, like you felt like a superhero like it's, you knocked a bag down off the chains 100 <laughs> percent. it's so funny because every time i post like a, a new pr you know and and then when i went and i i actually when i got your belt and i was just like this is like so like i'm so excited because i love hitting those i never thought that i'd be you know deadlifting 295 pounds or you know track Damn. bar deadlifting 305 or yeah this yeah, is it's weird to and that pe- have your feeling. body do that right well, you know what it is? It's the control. And like here, I love when I remember when I first was squatting with Damn. Phil, first deadlifting, the grind, <laughs> awesome. the grind. When I first pull and I have everything on and everything that we've worked on is on and I'm pulling and he's like, you've got to grind through that. You can't try to lift it fast because yeah. in boxing, it's speed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's speed right. power, like speed power, the turn of the punch. But here I'm like holding it and I'm like lifting and that moment of that grind, it's like, I got this. And it's like I said, the mental, it's it's powerful. It's kind of funny too, because you're like, I'm fucking trying and it's not moving yes, anywhere. Yes. Or, it's, or it's just barely moving. You're like, what? But he's like, keep doing it. Yeah. How like, long is this going to take? Yeah. And that, that was one thing that I that I seen with the boxers were that if it wasn't coming up fast, it wasn't coming up. You know, so yeah. we had to get there. We had to back them off a little bit because some of them are going to be more explosive and powerful than they are strong. Mm-hmm. So that's why when we look at weaknesses, I'm looking at that too. How well can they strain? And again, that's going to set the baseline to increase their power production mm-hmm. going further. When did you discover your legs? Because we were before the podcast, <laughs> you were saying you had eight knockouts before you were actually punching using, using my your le- legs. I, so. You know, I think I think when I started Olympic lifting, I, I was using because I was doing um, I was snatching, mm-hmm. and I you know, and I think um, that's when I did. I worked with the strength and conditioning coach um, Vincent Sullivan, who's out of um, Mount Vernon, uh, New York, and he did a lot with football players. So he used a lot of his strength and conditioning. Like he didn't know like how to, he just programmed for me for boxing, but he didn't train fighters. Mm -hmm. So he's like, all right, let me think about it from a standpoint of like, what do you guys use? You know, strength, power. And I think that's when I realized when I had to squeeze my glutes and kind of come up, you know, um, that was a big part of it. I I trained with him for a couple of years. And I was, I think I was, I was too young and immature to really understand. But immediately when I got with Phil, I was like, oh my gosh, like I remember this, but now we're developing more of my glutes. And I know that I have to, you know, my core. That's another thing too. Like, the core was so important and the only reason i had a strong core was because i give body shots and i want to be able to take what i could give so i want to make sure that my core was strong mm-hmm. i didn't know about stability or like i didn't know my core was had to brace i didn't even think about that or even when i was fighting it just came naturally and i just said okay i don't want to have to take this punch because i've been hit to the body once and i froze my legs froze i mean it was in sparring 
and I literally just stopped and I was like, oh my God, I can't move. I'm like, what the hell's going on? My brain's like, move. My body's like, no, we're going to stay right here. So, um, that, look, those body shots, it's like a four or five second delay, too. Yeah. yeah. Guys know what I'm talking about when they get hit in the nuts. <laughs> it, it, it's like, you got hit, you know it's bad news, and then it's like one, two, and then you're like, oh, yeah. like it just all of a sudden yeah. kills you. Over. Body shots are the same yes. way. It's like four seconds later mm-hmm. where you're just like, oh just my down. God, that fucking hurt really bad. Yeah. Your body shuts down. You can't do anything. But if you saw like the movement, like that that bounce and stuff like that, like knowing, because I used to bounce with no purpose. I bounce because it would set my rhythm. Now I bounce with a purpose, mm. and I'm able to pivot. I'm able to step to the, you know, like uh, a quick step. Demonstrate to the right. on him and see for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll clear out. <laughs> yeah, so it helped with angles and yeah. all that stuff. So, um, but discovering my legs, it just changed my game, and it made me. Like I said, the mental aspect of it, so much more confident going into mm-hmm. a fight, knowing that, you know, if my arms got tired, I still got my legs and I use my legs a lot. I'm a boxer puncher, mm-hmm. so I'm very comfortable on the inside. But now I can move around and then I could sit and bang if I want to and then I can go back out. So it gives me that freedom to say, oh, I'm in control at all times. Is that something you see in boxing often? Athletes not being able to use their legs and just throwing from the body? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fem- I think females, um, there's a lot of that with the females because, you know, you understand, like, again, again, boxing, you know, females are just now coming onto the scene and understanding and women weren't introduced until the Olympics until 2013 oh, in boxing. Yeah, see, a lot of people don't know that. So I didn't have the opportunity to go to the Olympics. I turned pro in 2005. So, you know, now seeing the development and it's still a little bit different, but they're starting to. And I, I love that they understand the importance of strength and seeing the legs and Women like myself, when they see me do a deadlift and lift 295, and then they see me, you know, boxing and moving, they're like, oh, you're not slow. I'm like, no, I'm not. (laughs) Because I'm, it's like functional training. And they're like, oh, and then a lot of these women now are like, hey, she does this, I wanna do this. Because they see the progression. Mm -hmm. And and I'm glad that that I can kind of open the eyes a little bit of of a lot of these, hopefully trainers and and these female fighters to to want that. You know, and even just for the longevity of, of, of sport, you know, because I'm, I'm 39 years old. I'm not embarrassed to say that. You know what I mean? And I'm in the best shape. It's like, oh, you look great. I'm like, yeah, well, I take care of myself, but now I know I can take care of my body, you know? Yeah, and this looks terrible. You're in a belt squat <laughs> while hitting pads. Yeah. Let me tell you something. I, I, me. I wanted to throw up so bad. Yeah, this looks insane. So I was like, is this mental? I'm like, did I do something <laughs> wrong? You know, um, I love, I you know, the belt squat, the reverse hyper, and the GHR are probably my favorite Mm-hmm. pieces of, of, of machine and I guess he's yep. taught me well because those are my favorite and I'm like oh whenever the reverse hyper like I was like whenever something's hard I'm like I want to get this mm-hmm. so with the reverse hyper I'm doing what, like three or I've done like three plates six plates total and yeah. some of the guys are struggling the fighters the boxers and I'm six like six plates on the reverse hyper yeah I did three and three yeah. right, Jesus yeah. That's and awesome. I, I do it for 20, 20 reps 20, 20 uh, reps. yeah so 100 total but I understand how to use my body, and and I don't even know because I until the fighters because like I said I was one of his first you know boxers to well I was his first to be able to yeah. like consistent fighter mm-hmm. and then the boxers would come in the guys that are bigger than me mm-hmm. and they're like one of the guys like how is Maureen he's like a oh, he's like yeah. a cruiserweight he's like how is she lifting more than me yeah. and I'm like this is great <laughs> like, yeah. you know, finally the girl can do what the guy can't do yeah. you know yet now he's doing more than I me I talk shit to him all the time about <laughs> too, but, 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 come on man. So, <laughs> like, look at her. Fucking 190 pounds. Let's, let's get it going. <laughs> How does someone keep their uh, explosiveness? You know, if you are training heavy, yeah. um, you know, we do, we do hear it all the time, uh, but she's training heavy and mm-hmm. she's able to still keep it. Is it, um, is it because you're practicing both? You know, it's because, is it because you're working on speed and strength kind of yeah, together, I, I guess? Mark, you know this, right? You already know the question or the answer to the question. Um, we work conjugate and we work dynamic effort right. mixed in there. So again, I put an emphasis on the focus points of what they need at that particular time, especially if they're getting closer to the fight, then we're obviously gonna be more along the line of velocity. So we're gonna be working more explosive strength, speed strength. And then throughout the year, you know, depending on if they do have a fight, if they're off camp, if we're working GPP, I'm still gonna do some type of explosive movements. So it is going to. we're still gonna be doing med ball throws, we're still gonna be doing jumps. If they have that base of GPP, we're gonna be doing that. So I start off that, you know, depends on who I have. Like Maureen, she's been with me for a long time. So now we can just get her going throughout the years. So we run the conjugate pretty much all year round until she has a fight, then I'll go into a transition phase 
we should be doing some GPP. But. Is uh, max effort stuff straight up max effort stuff? Is it like for them, for the boxers, because they've been with me so frequently? Yeah. So we'll go even with the max single. She's hit, she hits PRs every week, you know, but, um, you know, it does depend on the individual. Like my MMA guys aren't as frequent with me. So we'll do threes and fives. Sometimes I'll even just do a, a standard block. We'll do juggernaut pretty much. I've, I've worked that with them and I'm actually transitioning a lot of that over to the MMA guys because I am seeing that I'm now, because I have my own spot, I'm able to put out, you know, bring who I want in, to be honest with you, and work with the people that I want. And so now I have an understanding of their schedule. Where before it was like 60 fighters, mm -hmm. guys coming in, I gotta be ready at all times. And a lot of these guys are taking fights on short notice. So that's why the conjugate was so beneficial for me. Now with them, I know that they're strong, they have that base. Now we can go ahead and push the envelope a little bit more. Obviously in a safe manner, making sure that they are appropriately in the right position and making sure that they have the structural integrity to withstand that load. And they'll be, it'll take a while to adapt, right? Like at first when they start doing some of the max effort stuff, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they are kind of fatigued in their oh, yeah. training. Maybe mm -hmm. their training is off for a week or two. How long does yeah. that usually take uh, some of these fighters? Um, what do you mean after a fight? Or just, just to kind of start to adapt to the program that you start to put them on. I mean, it does take a minute. It does. Uh, I would say at least a couple months for them to really understand it. You know, so I'll start off doing those threes and fives, working on some AMRAP sets. And then again, we're just increasing the technical efficiency of the lift. So I, I choose usually four to six lifts that we can alternate throughout the time frame. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if I'm doing threes and fives, I'll keep that week by week and I won't vary it all the time. Now, if I have uh, somebody like Maureen, I can vary it every every week. So again, we'll be doing box squats, we'll be doing rack pulls, we'll be doing sumo deadlifts, we'll be doing trap bar deadlifts. You know, anything that's going, we'll switch bars, anything that's going to enhance the force production that we need to. But I would say about two months is really when we get to see them start to come into their own and I can really push the envelope a little bit more. And I think that's scary for a lot of fighters because I know it was scary for me when I was like, this is not good for me. I can't box. I can't move my leg. Not I can't move, but it was like I feel this. I feel that. But I think like for any fighters that are listening that that are gonna that are contemplating or wanting to go in, I say do it and trust the process because I found so much. Um, it's it just great, you know. And it wanted me to stay kind of like in the weight room and stay strengthening those things because not only is it good for my fighting, but it's good for my overall well being, you know, physically, you know. And and I, uh, you know, I have less injuries. You know, I, I mean, I've only been injured, um, you know, once in boxing, really, and had to have a surgery. That was it. And, and you know, I have like 33 fights, you yeah. know, and only wow. only one serious injury, you know. So I feel that like um, being consistent, you know, with the strength and conditioning and understanding the, the importance of uh, body awareness and working those muscles, I think has really helped me to stay injury free and being smart. So are you at all because like you've had 33 fights, you fight a lot. Are you worried at all about getting hit in the head too much or is it just because like you're so strong you're able to like she's got good defense she's got good defense <laughs> okay i think that was yeah my head movement has been something that i've been complimented on since the beginning and yeah. i watched a fighter by the name of arturo Gotti, and even though arturo was still like a, a warrior inside there his head movement and his you know we talked a little bit about that like with mike tyson how it was just so unique and i learned to take I watched male fighters coming up because there weren't many females and the females didn't move the way that I felt I could move. So I watched Roy Jones, you know, I watched, uh, you know, um, you know, even Tyson, you know, throwing his left hooks. My left hook was always my best punch because I knew I could come around, you know, and come around and then rip it from the floor, you know. Um, but I think watching Arturo or, or uh, watching even like older fighters, Pernell Whitaker, you know, that that movement and making their styles kind of my own. So I'll do things where I'll sit on the ropes and I'll swing on the ropes. Because people forget the ropes are there for a purpose. They're loose mm -hmm. for a reason. Mm -hmm. So why don't you use them? So I'll lean on them and I'll lure an opponent on. And I'm okay because a lot of girls fall for it anyway. Even my sparring partners that know, oh, I'll literally put myself on the rope and I'll just stay there. And I'm like, all right, come on. Yeah. And then when I do it, I'll sit, I'll swing, and then I'll snap. Mm -hmm. You know, And they always get hit with the left hook. And mm -hmm. then I pivot them, I pivot out, or I'll turn them and put them on the ropes. <laughs> you know, Learning how to be present in the moment and, and, and just set up your punches. So I think um, the defense part of it you know, but obviously, listen, I knew going into the sport, maybe not when I was younger, but I understand now, especially at my age and knowing that I don't have to do this. I want to do this mm -hmm. and really owning my why. And people ask, like, why do you do this? I'm like, because I can and I'm good at it and I'll stop when I'm ready. And that's a big thing with fighters. I think that, you know, they kind of like, oh, they don't they don't stop when they're supposed to. And mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be. Plus, I have amazing people around me between my boxing coach, Derek Santos. I've got, you know, with Phil and I'm, I'm very grateful 
that I have um, these people around me that, and my manager too, who I've been with since I was 21. I know that that's going to be, um, and this is a good fight because she was an MMA fighter. Mm. You know, she was a very awkward, so she threw punches and I was kind of like, all right, I had to use my timing. This was actually when I was training in Oxnard, California. Um, and this is before Phil. Yeah. See, I leaned into that right hand and I stayed there. Doing the ball slams, yeah, as a left hook. The ball slams now are, are throwing the balls. I pivot right back. I don't leave my right hand out there. See, I'm leaving that hip. That's a lead, that's my my hips. How you old know. are you in this one? I was 34, yeah. 34, I think. Yeah, that was in Oxnard, California. I met you a year later. Huh? I met you a yeah. year yep. later. Mm -hmm. Then, because then I came. Well, it's ironic because I, I also I was injured. I got injured, and then um, I met Phil, and I said, and then coming back from that injury because like I said I had one injury my whole career so now I'm like sitting here going um I don't know and I, t I was told by the surgeon that that did my surgery that I'd never box again mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah he said that's it I oh let me tell you that's all that's a that's a whole other podcast because that was like I was <laughs> mentally completely screwed at that point because I'm sitting there going he's like well what level are you and as a female I'm like what do you mean what level am I <laughs> like I'm a two-time world champion like what do you but I was you know so Long story short, um, with with my mental resilience and my self belief and faith that I have, you know, and, and I know God has a purpose for my life. I'm like, nope, I'm supposed to be here. And meeting him was a gift. And then, you know, going forward, I'm like, all right, I just I'm just with the wrong people, or maybe this is, or it's time for me to move on. Not the wrong people, but it's time for me to move on from where I was. Mm. And that's when I, I moved to Florida. Yeah, even in this fight, like especially in the later rounds, you can see your head movement is still like mm -hmm. it's insane even before you met Phil, but like yeah, she see. can't really touch you even in the later rounds. <laughs> yeah. <pretty> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I got her timing. Plus I kind of use my, my movement to kind of like Oof. deter them. They're like, what, where's she going to come with? Now I use more of my angles. Um, but this was a, this was a, yeah, this, I think this fight went, I think it was eight rounds. <laughs> I think yeah, but it was um yeah you know, she was a tough girl, very tough. Like I said, has an MMA background along with a boxing background. Uh, she trained with Holly Holm. Holly oh. Holm was a, a you know a very decorated uh, fighter. Yeah, she um Noheen Dennison. I, I had a lot of respect for her after the fight. You know, I said to her, I was like, you're you're a warrior, but those are the girls that I want to fight. See that she did the little shake like Holly. She came out. I was like, oh here we go. <laughs> like what's gonna? Because you don't know with the rhythm change. You know where the punches are going to come from. Phil, have you found it easier? You know, now that you have your own spot, and then you have you know some other some other fighters doing really well. Have you found the mental side of it, like trying to convince people, and like you know maybe someone like Maureen, uh, she's in there doing something, and they see her doing it, and they kind of just mimic her, and you don't have to explain as much. You feel like that side of it has maybe gotten a little uh, just a little easier for you, maybe. It definitely, you know, I, I have my culture. Own, yeah, well, I have my own equipment now, like I have my own space you know um, and I'm able to take my time with the athletes that I have you know instead of me back to back to back with hours on hours of training now I set the time up to where yeah, it was I a wild to. amount I mean I remember you saying you had like 60 fighters and yeah yeah we looked at the roster the other day because I was like taking some off and putting some on and I'm like I had like 62 at one point so I'm like okay now we dropped it down we have 23 so it's not as bad <laughs> yeah. but i can group them up according to what they need mm -hmm. you know or according to where they're at in camp or if they're off camp so now i have guys coming in they're off camp they're in the off camp group when they're in camp they're in the in camp group and then for the boxers we uh we mix it up so we'll go boxers have their own group and they got a pretty significant group there this is my mma crew here and uh so these two are actually fighting in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. so as Brendan, he fights for the UFC, and then Phil Hoss, who just got a knockout win in the Contender Series, he's just got uh, a contract with the UFC. He's fighting next week, Damn. and these guys are fucking insane. Like this dude here, mm -hmm. he could play in the NFL if he wanted to, but Jeez. super strong, jacked, mm -hmm. you know, humble, sweet guy, yeah, like yeah. killer, but just a sweet, like really, really nice guy. Mm -hmm. What was he doing right there? Just push-ups. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, he's, like, stuff, huh? he's pushing, yeah. the, pushing the earth down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was potentiation clusters, you know, triphasic method, right? So I'll utilize mm -hmm. that. You guys mm -hmm. had Cal on. So mm -hmm. basically what we'll do is do, we'll do a four week triphasic block of potentiation clusters where all I'll these increase. people are moving really well. Yeah, not bad for MMA guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just mentioned Cal. Do you guys uh, implement RPR methods for training? Um, I did. A while back, uh, I'm more so deeper into FRC and then also doing some PRI stuff too as well where we're increasing respiratory rate, making sure that they can breathe efficiently mm -hmm. and then that's going to set up their postural alignment. But 
as far as that goes, not so much. Obviously, I use a lot of oxygen advantage when it comes down to getting the body ready for whatever stresses when it comes to conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's helped us a lot with the breath holes. You, you can probably oh, attest to that. We did that pre-fight. We mm -hmm. had a he did a, I I was so for me going into a fight, you know, that first round, you're always like, you know, but doing the breath holds, I felt like I was able to ease in to the fight so much easier because my body was already primed. Mm -hmm. With I didn't have to go into that like, oh God, the first round, even just my anxiety, all of it. You know what I'm saying? Like I just went that for me, the mental was so like because you know, you feel that that feeling before the fight because you're doing the breath holds. Yeah. And I understand the importance of really pushing that to the point of like, yeah. all right, I really have to do this, right? Because mm -hmm. then when I went in, that was the first time I experienced it like literally minutes before getting in the ring. And I'm like, these are amazing. <laughs> I'm like, I wish I've had these, you know, but now knowing going forward, I have that because it, I was just so much more relaxed in the fight because once it started and she came at me, I'm like, oh, my body reaction didn't affect my mind. They worked more together, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Can we please talk about that? Because I remember before my <laughs> fight with Chad, I was yeah. texting, I'm like, hey, Phil, tell yeah. me exactly what I need to do right now in terms of breathing. Yeah. And once that match, I wasn't tired at yeah. all. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, essentially you're trying to make your body cope with CO2 buildup, right? So we're increasing the ability to take in oxygen, utilize it efficiently, and then from there, from a physiological standpoint, you're driving blood flow to the working tissue alongside mm -hmm. the mental side of it where you're like, okay, I can cope with not having a lot of air. So again, you got the physical, physiological, and then the psychological aspect of it. Whereas basically what I'll do is I'll do five or I'll do two sets of five breath holds, right? and I'll do it maximally with paces. So you blow, breathe in, blow all your air out, hold your nose, hold your breath, walk for as long as you can. And honestly, you wanna get up to a large number. What'd you get up to when you did it? In terms of paces? Yeah. I think like 50 or 60. Okay, mm -hmm. so I got a guy by the name of Jared Gordon, and this guy is phenomenal, and he's got a crazy past. I'll, I'll talk about that later, but yeah. Uh, but he fights in the UFC. Mm -hmm. He's got 110 paces. <sighs> yeah. Mm -hmm. God dang. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, 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 110. He's got the he's got the record. He did it yesterday. <gasps> oh, he did it wow. the other day. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, you could see that. Okay, he can go. He mm -hmm. can move efficiently because he's walking efficiently with the proper gait. Obviously, you know, it's different when you're shadow boxing or moving. But again, he still is able to cope with that air hunger, which is very important, especially when you're getting, you know, when you're in grappling situations and mm -hmm. you know how it is. And fucking Chad's probably big shit trying to lay on top of you or something like that right <laughs> yep so you have to be calm in those situations right and and practicing that and adapting to that particular stimulus is going to enhance the quality of outputs long long term and and, and we do it i like to do it pre-training and also pre-fight mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so that's something you implement often with all your fighters not just before a fight but like yeah. before mm -hmm. training sessions yeah yeah and we'll do it. i know people like so we're being a little vague here, but maybe this is something we can give to the people. Exactly what does somebody do to do that? As far as the, that, as far as the process, yeah, the procedure of the breath holds. So I'll start off, well, first we'll do breath of fire, which is basically one second in, one second out, and that's to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. So okay. we're trying to increase the the ability to have energy, right, mm -hmm. for, the, for the training itself. And then after that, we would do our breath hold. So you would take, like I said, a normal breath in, a normal breath out, hold your nose, hold your breath, walk for paces. Again, try to increase your paces over time. You're gonna do that as soon as you cannot hold it enough, blow all the air out, do it again, repeat it five times. Then we take about a minute to two minute break. They'll shadow box nasal breathing only. Mm. So now we're increasing again. We're bringing down that stimulus, bringing them back down to a parasympathetic. So it's a rise and fall, right, in a sense. And they're still able to be functional. They're still able to be technical even when they have that that limited air supply, mm -hmm. right? And then again, we repeat it five more times and then studies have shown, and then my, through my experience, we've increased the ability to have that energy output to repeat every time, so. And again, yeah. you're, you're looking, like I said, is, is from a physiological <clears throat> side, we're trying to increase the blood flow, trying to increase oxygen utilization, bring in ATP to the working tissue. And Maureen, like, I mean, what have you noticed as a fighter? Because like when I started learning about some nasal breathing stuff, and I don't probably know as much as you guys, but when I started doing that, it made a big difference mentally for me. So for oh, you, yeah. like, were you, did you have dysfunctional breathing before you started doing this stuff? And how did it I change a, for you? I have a deviated septum. Ooh, 20% breathing capacity. 
wow. like barely in this nostril. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I can still do that and have to breathe like the control and going into the fight with this still like this. And this happened. I mean, this happened in a sparring session when I was like, I don't know, before I turned pro, um, I got head butted mm -hmm. and my nose went boop, to the right, you know, and, and then repeatedly, you know, in, in fights and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Even after that fight that you saw there, I had to go the next day and get it adjusted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, OK, it's still there. I'll get a new nose when I'm done. But how do I cope with that? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, while yeah. I'm still, you know, and I think that the nasal breathe, like doing those kinds of breath holes and forcing it in a non pressured situation. So practicing them in the gym and knowing that I can mentally when I go into the fight, I'm like, no, no, no I, I know what this is. But I wanted to say, I think I felt it in the fight, but I think when we did stadiums mm -hmm. and we did breath holes, because stadiums, mm -hmm. I mean, they suck, but I love them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, him between uh, when we did it, you know, up and down at the FAU stadiums that we do it, um, he'd have us do breath holes between our sets of, of, of stair runs. And that really like, and only nasal breathing. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, because it's your whole body and you're mm -hmm. just like, and you're trying to focus on stepping and not falling and all this stuff. But being able to control the breath and calming my mind, really. I think that's the biggest part, the anxiety part of it, where I'm just like, like you you're you're here you're in control you have oxygen you're not going to die there's mm. oxygen everywhere you know i think that helped too with the anxiety aspect and the mental part of it um for a fight yeah, wow. what's pri you mentioned pri I, I don't know what that is the yeah, postural restoration institute is basically for me i'm just starting out in it so i'm not going to go deep like i'm an expert in it so mm -hmm. i'm actually getting certified in it as soon as I'm done with the certification. Yeah. But we'll talk more about that next time. But yeah. <laughs> for the most part, I'm not gonna go, oh yeah, I know everything. No, I got no. you. But yeah, definitely I'm learning it. I think it's something that was brought to me by Christiana Marin, my, my physical therapist. And she was like, you know, this is definitely gonna help mm -hmm. your, your athletes out if you can teach them how to breathe into the diaphragm appropriately. And we're talking more deep into detail, right? This is more from a, from a uh, not from a physiological side, but for, more for like biomechanical. Mm -hmm. So enhancing that ability, like I said, I have a couple of fighters that have that dysfunctional breathing pattern built in because just of years of trauma and not knowing how to breathe properly. So if I can do that, if I can get that done, not from just the physiological side, but from the biomechanical side, then we're gonna be in a good good position to just be more successful down the line. Is that some of the stuff where you're like blowing up balloons and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, right. I, I have, uh, well, Christiana, she'll, she'll do that. She'll mm -hmm. make us like lay 90-90 and blow into the, I mean, it's, it's good because you get to understand to breathe and utilize that diaphragm appropriately. I have my wife do it because she has spinal thesis, which is the same thing that, that Sean has. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, when I work with Sean, I'm like, this is perfect because I'm dealing with it every day with mm. my wife right you know so we work on that type of breathing i think it's a good tactile cue for sure to increase the ability to breathe diaphragmatically yeah um i know coach house is a big fan of it i don't know if you do you know uh coach house yep, yep. yeah yeah he's a big fan of it and he was doing that at super training like a couple years back and i was just kind of looking at him funny <laughs> And he's like, Bell, he's like, don't even give me that shit. He's like, everyone's going to be doing this soon enough. He's like, everyone's always a couple years behind yeah. Coach House. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And here we are talking about it right yeah. now. <laughs> like, he's, wasn't wrong. He's, he's definitely a legend in the strength and conditioning Oh, world, he's amazing. Sure, man. I, I would like to meet him if I could, man. It'd be great. But And he's close to me, too. He's in yeah. Carolina, so. Yeah, he wouldn't be too far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have Greg Hardy who, who worked with him. I always ask Greg, he's like, how was he? He's like, he's just like you. He's like, he's trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> this fighter you mentioned with the crazy paces, you mentioned something about his past. You said he wants to go into it. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I'll let him, I actually want, maybe we can get him on the podcast. Yeah, yeah he's know, got a great story. crazy past. Great story. Um, you know, right now they're they're doing a documentary on him. Oh, snap. Yeah, so, and I think it's going to be on ESPN 30 for 30. So we'll oh, see, shit. hopefully. I'm not, I don't want to speak out of turn, but that's where we're going to. And yeah. again, just when you're talking about triumph and overcoming obstacles this kid has done that you yeah. know and then some you know so i'll let him speak on it more i didn't want to go too crazy on it but just say to to see where he's at just like with this young lady here to see where they're at you know same thing with me i've been through my past mm -hmm. you guys know you've mm -hmm. done your research we right <laughs> i look at it i'm like yesterday this so listen yesterday i was able to get my whole crew to go first class to fly out first Dang. class. Oh. Nice. so you know, like it's it's a great feeling. I right? love that. So I'm like, I'm sitting there. I'm like, I'm looking. I'm, There's only one problem, of, though. Go ahead. 
there's no turning back. There's no turning back. <laughs> no turning back. I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't go back downhill. You can't <laughs> sit with the peasants ever again. That's yeah. true, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to get hate after this one. Oh, well, again, I, I guess I put it in my mind like, oh, my knee, though. My knee. I need, I need, a, lot of, I need a lot of space. I remember when I was booking the flight, I was like, so this is the pr-. And he's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. so I was, I was, but it's, it's good to, to have that ability to do that, you know? Yeah. And that was part of the reason why I do what I do, you know, and it's not just, it's not just to help myself. It's to help everybody around me that, that truly look to me to help them, okay. you know? And I just want to, I want to just say something about Phil too. You know, it's like, you know, I, like you said, I've overcome stuff, but people that appreciate that, you know, I appreciate, like we tell each other all the time how grateful I said, I'm so grateful for you. Like, thank you for including me in your journey and in your life. Um, because I don't take that lightly, you know, and, I, and I've had people the same thing. That's when you know you have the right people around you when they show gratitude. And I think that's something important that a lot of people forget that, you know, I'm, you know, everything's happening and we're doing so great and the gym's going good and everything's growing and building. And I always knew that was going to happen working with somebody like Phil. But now it's like you have to stop and realize like what it took for him to get here mm-hmm. and why you're here. Why am I? Because I, I deserve that and I'm worthy of that too. But I'm grateful. Like I'm always grateful for every opportunity and especially even at my age and still being able to be in boxing and where women are going i'm, I'm grateful mm-hmm. and maureen before we actually got on the podcast you were mentioning how um and mark was even mentioning how like men get into boxing mm-hmm. for a different reason like you said that you noticed something about women getting into boxing mm-hmm. what was that exactly um so like i said um, i think anybody that gets into combat sports there's something inside because mm-hmm. i said we're a little crazy. You know what I mean? We're all a little crazy. I'm like, I punch people in the face for a living and I enjoy it. Like, that's a little crazy. I'm definitely off. I definitely, you know, um, but I I, uh, I embrace it. And I think with women, it's so, we're so much more emotionally charged, you know, that it's so not common, um, especially when I first started. There was like a handful of female boxers and not many, and we were considered an attraction. I'm like, how come nobody can just see us? They don't just get it. You know what I mean? We're not seen. We're just like considered just like a sideshow, you know? And, um, you know, I think that comes with the overcoming and maybe personalities. And I know for me, you know, I actually was in an abusive relationship uh, when I started, when I started, bo- when I found boxing, mm. I went to the gym to better myself for, for my abuser. I thought I was fat and ugly and all the time. And I posted about it today, my low self-esteem. And um, I went to the back, I went to a fitness gym and then I went to the back and there was a boxing ring. And right there I was like, oh wow. Like I told you, I only saw um, Tyson and Holyfield. And when Tyson bit Holyfield's ear, what resonated with that was not the boxing. It was the emotion that Tyson had. Mm. So I connected with the emotion, not so much the, the, the skill, mm. you know, or the athleticism. It was like, oh my gosh, like not that I've ever wanted to bite somebody's ear, but I felt sure. that uncontrolled rage and that anger and that just displaced emotion. And so when I went back there and I found it, I, I it just helped me so much to kind of channel my energies because boxing is very unforgiving. And, uh, you know, boxing literally became the architect that rebuilt me and, and it taught me things that my parents couldn't teach me you know and it was it was tough lessons but i value that and i see now a lot of women are starting to gravitate to the sport for similar reasons you know but women are also develop, starting to um, accept their athleticism and their abilities you know and and you know we are created um different men and women but there's things that women have that are that are special and that the men can't do and men have things that women can't do and that's okay mm-hmm. and i think embracing our individuality as as human beings is so important and learning how to apply that and make it exciting and 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 learn and grow and heal i think healing is a big part of it and i know some people like how do you heal from like oh unless you've been in combat sports i'm sure you can you know there's things you go through and and overcoming those moments and discovering that the true self in those moments where you're in a dark place or you're in a a low place Mm. and i just literally posted this morning about self-worth and self-esteem on my instagram about that moment it was a picture of me at the track and you can see it in my face and you can see there's actually sweat dripping from my skin, my, my, my chin. And I'm like looking and I don't, I mean, I know I was like, man, like I gotta do this. Like, I can do this. And finding that, that digging deep inside of you to say you're, you're good, you know? And, um, you know, sharing that with people and, and discovering within myself, it just made me so much stronger and able to tackle anything in life. It's hard to exercise your mind um, without doing what you've mentioned, you know, without, you know, putting yourself through something mm-hmm. physically. And then you mentioned physical abuse. And then it's interesting that you choose another form of controlled physical yes. abuse, you know, kind of on your own will. Um, and sometimes with a coach, yeah. um, it, it's just, it's kind of interesting the way that, that uh, sort of balances itself out. But I always find a lot of this to be really interesting. Cause I think as people that do stuff physically, um, we don't have the ability to say, hey, I think maybe you can get the same thing from music or I think you can get the same thing from reading or I think you can get the same thing from writing. But I would say that I, I would be open to that idea because 
people just might love that as much as we love getting oh, punched yeah, in the face sure. or punching somebody mm-hmm. else in the head or whatever, yeah. whatever it might be, you know? So I think that, you know, for, I would love to see everyone do something physical because I don't think they maybe can comprehend what it can actually do for your mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's a lot of science behind that and yeah. stuff like that too. Uh, however, um, I think that, you know, you might be able to get there through some other means, but you need to find, you need to have something. Yeah. You have something that you really love, something that you, that feels like it uh, gives you purpose. Well, sure. I think stepping out of your comfort zone is a big part of it because yeah. I was definitely uncomfortable walking to the back of a gym mm-hmm. with all these male killers in an abusive relationship and there was something that pushed me to do that you know it's the same thing i think just stepping out of your comfort zone and just saying you know what just show up just show up and see what happens you know and and you'll know once you learn how to trust yourself and understand the signs and then i mean i was very fortunate and i've trained with high level um men and i've discovered and 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 built relationships with a lot of strong women who i can relate to i just had a conversation uh yesterday with a young lady who we don't we just met but we have so much common. She's younger than me. She's 27. We had so much commonality in sharing our stories of overcoming. And, and, and she asked me questions. And I asked her questions and just growing together. And the same thing with men. I mean, Phil and I have had such in-depth conversations about life and living and how we apply sport or whatever our passion is, business, mm-hmm. you know, t- to that. And it's just it's a, it's a beautiful thing when you can communicate that and, and be able to be vulnerable in those moments and, and grow. You mentioned sparring. And I'm curious, like when you started, you started. Oh, how, what, how old are you when you started boxing? I found boxing at 17. So I walked to the back of that gym when I was like 17, 18 years old. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And the sport's obviously continuing to grow in terms of mm-hmm. women's boxing. Mm-hmm. But did you have struggle finding sparring partners? Like, I, I like feel like you probably had to spar with some dudes for a while, oh, right? still does. <laughs> still, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, uh, I remember it was very difficult. And uh, I used to spar my coach back then. And then it was hard. And, um, you know, and I also had some run ins where some guys didn't have the control. Mm. You know, I've worked with some real great guys um, that really worked with me. And I had to remember, like, you're not going to knock them out, Maureen, you know, just because they're men. Just, and it wasn't that I wanted to or even it was just learning how to control and, you know, how to, how to be. But the guys were so good with the guys I worked with. But then I definitely had that side of the guys that um, I hit them with a good shot. And they're like, oh, no, <laughs> you know, and then I and now I, I mean, I got hit. That's the body shot I took was from a guy. Oh. And I froze my soul. Oh, right, my soul plex. It was a good shot, and I was like, Ugh! and I literally was like, Ugh! but he didn't capitalize on it. Thank you know. But mm-hmm. I was like, all right. I, and I again, got you now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, like you know, ego played because this is a Gleason's gym in Brooklyn. Yeah. You know, where I trained for like eight years, and I'm just like, I'm just like frozen. I was like, all right, don't, don't. And I, again, like I said, ego. I'm like, don't go down. You're good. Just try to walk. And I'm like, I mean, I looked physically like I was like hobbling, trying <laughs> to like. I'm like, no, I got this. My jab was like this. I'm like, yeah. I'm throwing it. But um. You know, but then there were guys that, you know, they just, they don't know, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't want to say that a lot of them, maybe some of them wanted to show me something, you know, mm-hmm. but maybe, but I think some of them just didn't have the control and didn't know, but that's probably another reason why I have such good head movement. Um, I don't, I was like, you know what, I'll just move my head. But I've also had females in there that I've sparred with that, I'm like, we're not fighting. This is a sparring mm-hmm. session. Like, you're not going to get paid, you're not getting paid for this. You're not going to win. You know what I'm saying? And that's where you have to kind of have that, like, emotional maturity to be like, you know, and I've sparred at wild card. I've gone through that where it's like a show and I'm like, all right, as long as I know what I'm walking into, but it definitely was hard. Um, now I've, I've worked with some really great sparring partners and, and MMA fighters, uh, Trisha Cicero, who's going to be fighting. She fights for Invicta. She's been a sparring partner of mine. You know, mm-hmm. I've sparred with a lot of uh, females. Valerie Letourneau uh, is a friend of mine from before she was in Brooklyn with me when we were in our, our early twenties. And then I came out to, um, you know, I came out to Florida and she was getting ready for to fight Joanna and I sparred her with her boxing and it was great to be able to help and to see how far we've come. You know, so that was awesome for me to do because a lot of these females, they've been around the gyms, you know, whether it's kickboxing or boxing or something. And um, but now it's just so nice to see even, you know, we're in the gym. It's like nice to see a balance of females, males. So the the sports definitely evolved. And and now that I I can get that work, but I still spar the guys. I, I fight like a guy. A lot of people have said that, that to me. Um, so the style of female fighters has is evolving still, but I studied the men coming up. And it's not a knock to the women, but I definitely like I like to look more like like a Mike Tyson, like a like a um, a Roy Jones, you know, like a, a Miguel Cotto, you know, things like that. So I've watched their styles. So you're like, man, you definitely move. And I think it was more the head movement and the body shots. You don't see a lot of women. I know for a fact that there aren't many women that move like me head movement and but i have to attribute that to studying the men mm-hmm. i mean i'm a student of the game i would go home and fernando vargas uh, I, I would watch him you know i would watch all these guys bernard hopkins and i'm and i got to meet them and talk to them and i'm like yeah I, I watched you guys you know and arturo was a big one for me you know i was at his fight with mickey ward the first one and they had a huge trilogy but arturo was just a blood and guts warrior 
But when he boxed, he boxed beautifully. Yeah. And I was like, I want to do that. Like, I can do that. When you started, did you have someone uh, tell you, like, you're not going to be able to do this? You're not going to be able to learn this? Or were they more invite? Like, you know, were they were they like, hey, like, you know, this isn't for chicks. There's not a lot of, there's another oh, girls yeah. here. Like, did they tell you, like, hey, shut down this idea. This is a really bad idea. 100%. I had, um, I went to Mars Park Boxing Gym, and I'll say this. And one of the, mat he well, he was a matchmaker, and he ran the gym. And I remember going there. Called so his ass out. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna say his name, but um, no. But you know what? We're we're cool today. But I went to the gym and I knocked on the door and I was dressed in normal clothes and I said, "Hi, you know, I'm a boxer. I'm looking for a gym." He's like, "You don't look like a fighter." He's like, oh, "We don't have anything for you here." Literally, closed the door in my face. And four years later, he's matchmaking my fights in the garden. Yeah, hmm. you know. And then was yeah. he was he a little bit like that with everybody, or was it maybe because no, you're females? Okay. It's definitely the female yeah. thing. And I try okay. not to be like, but it's a fact. You know, yeah. I had a guy. Um, you know, he's actually. I mean, I'm gonna call this guy out, Joey Gamash. He, he's actually training uh, Tia Fimo Lopez for the Loma Joey Trinko Gamash. Fight. <laughs> but God bless him, <laughs> Joey Gamash. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because well, he was a former world champion, and, and, and I mean, a very good. I'm fighter. gonna end up at the bottom of a river <laughs> now because <laughs> I talked about. I said oh. Gamash. Joey Gamash. <laughs> But Joey's what a great, great name. Yeah, he's Joey's either in the great. mob or you totally just made that name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, That's well, rude. His name is Tom Smith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it's funny because I love it's funny. It's a funny story because now everybody's like talking about Tiafimo Lopez fighting Lomachenko and, and and you know Joey's training him and I'm like oh I got a story about Joey. It's like be careful the females you cross because we always got a story. Mm -hmm. So I said I said T said to me in, in the gym and this was way in the beginning. I was in my early twenties and he said you know. You know, kid, you don't look like you belong. You, you belong boxing. You be, you look like you belong in the kitchen baking pies. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I, thank God I, I credit this to my father and his slick mind. And I said, "Oh, really?" I said, "Well, I don't know how to bake pies." And he goes, "No, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, people from fighting. You know, they got a rough life. They've been in jail. They've done stress." I said, "How do you know I'm not a cold blooded killer?" I said, "How do you know I haven't done time?" Mm. And, but I said it like. Whew. And he just like looked at me. He was like, oh, okay. You got to show them you're equally as crazy. That's the key. <laughs> like, I'm like, whoa, I'm just as nuts. Like, if I act extra crazy, then they're like, all right, I ain't going to do that to her again. <laughs> and he didn't. But God bless him. Joey, he became a supporter of mine and um, his wife as well. Like, they're mm. great people. So it's just a funny story and how you come up. So, yeah, I've, to answer your question, I've definitely had that part of it. But it's, you know, I have a purpose and I have a belief. And I every time I, I've tried to leave boxing because it's wearing, you know, especially as a female. And it's it's just like an, an older female and I'm self-promoted. You know, I've done a lot of it on my own. Me and my manager, who was my first coach that took me seriously when I was 21 years old. You know, Luigi and uh, Luigi El Chesse. Yeah. I got them all. <laughs> 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 Names keep getting better. Yeah. We got the old Mario brothers. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, meanwhile, I'm Maureen Shea and I speak fluent Spanish. People are like, wait, I don't understand any of this. Yeah. But um, but yeah, so it's 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 been such a blessing for me now. You know, to to be able to have the people that support me and it's it's a fun. I mean, I could tell you stories for days. I have stories. It just you wouldn't believe it. Fighting in Mexico, just the things that happen in the corners. You know, the things you experience in fights and fighting in Mexico is a whole other. And I'm I'm half Mexican. And I love fighting Mexico, but things are different in Mexico. Mm. Really different, you know. So uh, it's a different experience. How so? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I feel like I you, wanna... Your face, because kind of, I was like, I'm real curious. It's just, I mean, I've had uh, fights. I'm not going to Mexico. No. Like if she wants me to go. I'm, I don't know You'll if go. I want to. You'll go. We just won't drink. The Andrew water. knows some people yeah. down there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All you have to do is just mention my name. You don't have to pay for a drink or Nothing, for a meal. Ever. That's yeah, it. Ever. Yeah. I don't know what you. What you, I don't want to know what you did to get that to happen. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> no. Just, uh, our boy Smokey was in Mexico, and Mark was like, Hey, you got to tell him this. I'm like, yeah, that's actually pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, it's funny. All those names that you were mentioning, they're definitely not from Northern California. No, yeah. no, yeah, no, not at all. Yeah. But um, but if, well, in Mexico, you know, it's just it's just a different it's a different game. That's their culture. That's their life. Right. You know, so it's very similar to like you know, even in Ireland, it's like that. In other countries, it's very much like that. So in Mexico, soccer and and um and boxing. Is it kind of like uh like Muay Thai in Thailand? Yeah, it, of course. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like everybody's boxed. Even the young girls. Believe it or not, women's boxing was bigger in Mexico, and they had bigger cells. I mean, the money that women make in boxing today, it's getting better, but it was terrible. Mm. You know, like we got paid peanuts. I mean, and still still do compared to what we we deserve. But um, the women in Mexico were getting. TV time they and you would think like in such a machismo country where it's more mm -hmm. like that the women were so respected you know and and they were you know they, they proved it and there were some great champions out there um, mm -hmm. you know and, and fighters that I actually you know going out there and fighting on the same undercards but as far as the difference I think um, you know um, 
I, they changed the rounds in between a fight because there was miscommunication. So one, I'll give you one example. So I'm, I'm at the at the fight and I go out and it's a, supposed to be a, a six rounder. I get to the ring and my my coach is like, all right, it's a it's a four rounder. They changed it because of TV. I'm like, all right, that happens. I'm mm-hmm. ready for a six rounder. So I go out and then in the third round, the ref said touch gloves. And then we touch gloves and then we I fight the last round like, OK. And then I come back and he's like, what are you doing? He's like, we got one more round. They changed it. I was like, so I had to go out and fight another three rounds. I mean, another two wow. rounds like that. So it was it was interesting. So you definitely um, have to be able to adapt, which is something I also learned with Phil, you know, ad- adapting under the adversity and the challenges. And he's done the same thing. It's time to get boxing. His... Yeah, pretty much. We're going to go two minute break right now. <laughs> And then we're going to go 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, they change it. I've had times where I get in the corner and, and the, the, the chair is rusted, so they couldn't open it, so I had to stand up between mm. rounds. You know, they, they've moved my fight. I fought at 11 o'clock at night after not eating since 1 o'clock because I didn't, yeah. Was, <laughs> I could go for days, but I definitely yeah. have, have withstood the challenges. So I'm like, all right, I'm good. The mm-hmm. confidence is there. But it happens sometimes, you know, and it happens in the sports, and um, it just you have to sit there and you can't fight it because the more you fight and get emotional about it, the more it's going to take away from your performance. So I think having that focus and that drive is... Did you point. utilize uh, some of the girl stuff as like fuel or did you just fucking ignore it and just say, I'm just going to go to work, put my head down and just and just work for it. I'm not going to mm-hmm. I'm not going to um, kind of claim this girl power type of thing. What, what did you do with it? I actually was like, I never looked at it like a female male thing. I'm like, there's no feminine or masculine in the word boxer. So I'm like, I'm just going to do it. And what I noticed was this. So when I was training out in Oxnard with Lomachenko's team or any of the teams, I trained with Victor Ortiz's team out there too. I'm like, okay, they may be faster, stronger, younger, but they can't outwork me. And I'm going to prove myself in the work. So I would show up and I would work. And I was a focused worker. And they had to respect me because I made them step their game up. Because, you know, as sometimes the guys would kind of like, but they're like, they can't let the woman beat them. Mm. So I just used that, I think. But I think when I was younger, I just didn't understand I'm like, well, I can do that. I think I was so much like, I belong here. You know, it wasn't so much being a female, it was just being a person. And I'm like, well, I'm just gonna do what I gotta do. And, and yeah, there's times where I'd go in there with like a bubble around me and just focus on the work. And a lot of that came, and I, I give that a lot to, you know, my dad, the way my dad raised me. You know, he's a retired detective, old Irish Catholic. He was a Marine and he's a lot older. My brother's 10 years older than me. So my dad kind of treated me like, like, a, like a boy, you know? And it was always like, there was nothing extra because I was a female. So I think that not understanding the difference, I just did. Mm-hmm. And I said, because my father, he always said that to me. He's like, if this happens, this is the consequence, male or female, and this is what you have to do. And I just developed that and just applied that to my boxing where I'm like, okay, well, I just, they can't deny me if I show up and I work. Mm-hmm. And even if they do, I'm just gonna keep showing up and work and then I'm annoying. And then they can be like, all right, it's almost like Million Dollar Baby, you know, the movie. I worked on the movie and it was funny because when I saw the movie, I worked with Larry Swank for the movie and you know, it was, that's exactly what it was. She just showed up and she got so annoying that he was like, all right, I got a trainer. She's here, what am I gonna do? Mm-hmm. And I felt the same way and I think females do that now, but I think it's more of an open mind from the male trainers. And it takes a very special man to be able to work with a woman too, you know, because we're, we're different mm-hmm. and then that's, that's okay. <laughs> all right, watch Go ahead, back. Phil. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying, just, that's, that's definitely how it is. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not gonna lie, females do push it a little bit harder. Mm-hmm. Uh, they do have a chip on their shoulder in a sense because they feel like they have to- Prove more. Prove more, mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. But like every female that I've worked with, has had that work ethic. She kind of takes it to the next level, in a sense, just because you could tell that she wants to achieve more every day. Um, she holds a lot of people accountable too, even the young kids. She takes them under her wing, and you know, where are you at? What are you doing? You know, so I, I don't really have to do much now. I just go in there and train them. You know, <laughs> and at the end of the day, like I, I can motivate, I can inspire, I can you know get you guys going, but um, you need to be self motivated too as well. And that's something as a fighter you definitely have to have because you don't have a you have a team, but you can't rely on that team when the cage door closes or when you step into the ring. Mm-hmm. Got it. Yeah, what's something a female fighter should be looking you know looking at when joining a new gym or maybe even a new coach? Like any tall tale signs that like okay this is going to be a good fit or maybe that's a red flag. Mm-hmm. Well, I think respect. I think the first thing is respect. Um, I've, I've, and I'm not gonna, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, it's no secret, but I've dealt with sexual harassment. I've dealt with, you know, I just, I never like went out. I just had to like figure out how to work it. And, um, you know, I'm grateful that I, I, I was, I've been in therapy since I was seven. I think, I think every, especially fighter should be in therapy. I'm a huge advocate for therapy, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I think, you know, me having that ability or having people around you that you're like, okay, 
how would the men that you respect and how would they treat you? You know, and a lot, a lot of women, like for myself, you know, I had daddy issues growing up, which is how I ended up in the abusive relationship, you know, because my dad was really hard on me and I thought that was love, you know, and it was love. It's his type of love, you know, but it's not the kind of love that I want in a relationship. Mm. So I think a lot of women going into a gym, um, just knowing that, you know, okay, but you got to respect yourself first. I say, you got to, you got to take ownership of yourself. So go into the gym, know your purpose. Don't go in there to try to hit on somebody, try to find a relationship, go in there with a purpose. You know, if that develops later on, great. But go in there for you first and then just watch how the men treat you and set set boundaries if you have to. You know, definitely set boundaries. I remember I would hit the speed bag and I had one of the guys uh, talking to me and he actually sent me a message. He's like, I remember you hitting the speed bag and I came over and talked to you and you were like, I'm focused on boxing right now. I'm not focused on men. <laughs> and, and he would just look at me. At first he thought I was gay, which I'm not, but it's okay. You know, but he just like looked at me. He was like, but I was that focused and that into what I was doing. So I think just go in there with your purpose. And also when it comes to um, being able to communicate with your coach is very important. Um, there were times where I, I had coaches that I couldn't communicate with, and um, learn, but learning how to communicate with them, and I feel like I, I really learned how men think, you know, um, in boxing, because I was around you guys so much that I had to kind of think like a man to a degree because of uh, adjust my thinking so that I was able to communicate. Because men are more black and white, women are more detail-oriented, and we, you know, we're all colorful. We're, you know, some guys, it's like, you know, I have to just be more specific, more, yeah. bl you know, more blunt, and saying, I feel this. Okay, why? And then just say this and not, oh, well, this happened and that happened. And because then you're like, you're, you guys check out. You know what I mean? Like, I know, I know, trust me. So it's like, you know, it goes there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I remember the first time I was like, you ask a lot of questions. Oh, yeah. She goes, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. I said, Okay, and then I really didn't know how many questions she was really gonna ask me, and then I was like, oh yeah, you really do ask a fuck ton of questions. Uh, but you know what's funny with you? I think um, when we train sometimes, I'll go into my, my, my female questions, and then he'd be like, just shut the fuck up and do it. <laughs> just stop thinking, and I'm like, okay. Yeah, and that's thinks, not abusive, it's like, I need to hear that. And I'm just like, okay, stop thinking so much. Just, just fucking lift it. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And I just do it. Is it the, and the, I love him for it. Is, yeah, females are analytical to a Overly degree. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's good to have the man to say, I think it's a good compliment, you know, um, and I work with females too. You know, I actually started working with Stephanie Cohen a little bit with her, with her boxing. Uh -huh. And that's been, that's been great because, you know, she also works with a guy, you know, but I know that it's just a different kind of approach. Mm -hmm. So I can say things to her in more of a photographic way or a visual way, but she also understands the mind of, of, of the men too, because she's in her sport, what she's done, yeah. you know? So it's, it's fun to kind of like have another female that gets it. And I'm just like, oh God, you know, when they do this and they do that. And she's like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to knock you guys, but it's different, you know. Yeah. But um, but it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's been great, and I think, like I said, I think it's a, it's a yin and a yang, it's a balance, and and I love it. Yeah, and are you working with uh, Paige Van Zant right now? Um, I, I actually I was mm -hmm. I was I, I did uh, take her on I was working with her and uh, we were going to do that, but Paige is still um, very much involved in her MMA, and for me as as a boxing coach, um, I take it for me it's it, it's work, you know, and I don't think sometimes. It's, it's different when an MMA fighter comes into the gym and just does it, does the boxing as, as an extra thing for their, for their uh, MMA twice a week. But with her, you know, I have to stay true to who I am and, and how I am as a coach. And I, I, and I didn't feel it was conducive for either one of us um, to, for her to be able to still do her MMA and learn boxing. So um, we, we, I told her that and she, 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 you know, she, she understood that, you know, and then it's just, I can't, I can't fake it. You know what I mean? I, I, I it's going to make it harder for me working with multiple coaches, because I already see it with the MMA in general, and I see how they have to really be present in the art that they're doing. So with, when it comes to the, the bare knuckle and the boxing, which is what it is, you gotta be really present, you know? Um, but you know, she's got a lot of experience. You know, she turned pro at 19, I have a huge amount of respect for her, but I just couldn't do my job. I couldn't do it the real way, and honestly, and, and, and uh, you know, give her the best of me if that was the conditions. So, so we we um we just let that go, you know. But I'm, I I support her as a woman, as an athlete, and I'll always be there for her. But I just I just couldn't I couldn't do that for myself and and to her. Yeah, I was surprised when she actually signed up to do uh, bare knuckle fighting as well, yeah. right? Yeah, I was I was too. Um, but you know, I mean, it's 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 interesting. And and um, David actually approached me to do it to fight bare knuckle. But for me, at where I'm at in my career, I mean. And again, I'm the level athlete where like I went to the fights because I was like, well, let me see. My manager was like, no. My coach was like, no. Everybody was like, you're not doing it. I'm like, I do something called whatever I want, first of all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Second of all, let me go there and put myself there. And just so for my own ego to say, I can do this, but I'm going to choose not to do it. It's more, it's more about my choice. Well, what's going on, man? <laughs> She's not doing it. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. 
<laughs> no, I'm Putting not, but it's not because, but it's, it's because right. I chose not to do it. Do Listen, it. you got to give me my... Like, <laughs> We're going to win the title. We're going to unify. That's it, yeah. And that's it. Yeah, that's the plan. That's that's <laughs> the plan. But no, I and I appreciate that. And I know they love me. But again, I'm the kind of person that, you know, the reason I started boxing, I stayed boxing because my father told me I couldn't. Mm. I boxed for different reasons. Like it was like my father said, in this house you have to work and go to school. You can't do all three. You know what I said? Watch me. And that's exactly what I did. And I've always been that to a degree stubborn, but that stubbornness has gotten me, it's gotten me, you know, into some tough situations, but it's also gotten me a lot of success. So I think it's how you approach it. Yeah. But, um, but no, I, I mean, you know, I was, I was surprised too, but I think it's an interesting thing too. But, but, you know, Paige is very much, a, she's a brand. Uh, she's, you know, and um, I think I think she's very athletic where people are like, oh, but she's not. I mean, people make compliments about her. I'm like, has anybody seen her dance? She's mm-hmm. a pretty phenomenal dancer. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's she was on Dancing with the Stars and because I watched her MMA fights and I'm like, oh, all right. I saw some strength, but I didn't see a lot. But then when I watched her dance, I was blown away by her athleticism and her uh, ability. And I said, OK, my approach for her was going to be because I dance as well. You know, I dance salsa and, and I said, OK, and, I, and this helped me a lot with my boxing. So I'm like, all right, I need to take her dance and apply it to the boxing. But first I have to break her down and make her stay basic because she's got mm-hmm. too much rhythm. She throws, she threw punches with no purpose and it, everything was like a bounce. Too much she's movement. too rhythmic. So I had to literally make her walk. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that was hard. So I was breaking her down. I wouldn't let her bounce. You know, um, I was ready to put weights on her legs. Say, no, just to remind you as a cue to stay, mm-hmm. just step, just step. You know, understand the purpose of this movement and the purpose of the angle. And, and that's what I do with anybody that I coach, which, you know, um, it's more of a passion project for me working and I'll, I'll help, I'll assist Derek sometime, my boxing coach with that. But it's more, I love to break them down because I, I mean, I was, that's what I had to do for myself. I had to figure it out because a lot of coaches didn't really want to teach me. So I was like, all right, how do I, how do I do this? You know what I mean? How do I got to figure this out? And I learned a lot from a lot of coaches, but I also had to go back to the fundamentals. And I think a lot of people abandon that. And I'm sure with lifting too. They're like, oh, they want to mm-hmm. lift this weight, but it's like, well, you got to learn how to do this before you do that. Mm-hmm. Same thing with boxing. Phil, did the uh, pandemic slow you down? Did it throw off a lot of fights and scheduling and a lot of things uh, like that? No, because it's MMA and they just don't give a damn, obviously, <laughs> right? And I'm in Florida, which they don't give a damn either, yep. right? So, <laughs> no, nah, we were we were going. Um, I had guys fighting in the UFC, had guys. Boxing was a little bit on the back burner. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of guys didn't have their fights lined up. Where they had their fights lined up, it got canceled. Um, but yeah, MMA was going you no know, nonstop. So yeah, we, Dana we, White did the Fight Island or whatever Fighter Island. Yeah, he's he's gonna be back there next weekend. I got two guys fighting on that card. I got three guys fighting the next week. So I mean, it's it's constant, you know. And that's that's good for them. They need that, you know. A lot of guys in that in that world, especially in the UFC, and they're coming up, and you know they they get paid only when they fight, you mm-hmm. know. And that's and that's one thing where it's like. When I was coming up fighting, like I had to have, I had to open up my own gym because I knew that I wasn't gonna have money coming in consistently, you know, and, and that takes away from your focus a little bit, which is an issue. Mm-hmm. So I try to make sure, like well, a lot of my fighters, most of them are, are trainers in my gym, you know, uh, she she works with me too in the gym. So I want to make sure that they still have the ability to work inside of where they need to, and uh, and still get the uh, the training out of it too as well. And now you have. It seems like a, a good amount of people uh, mm-hmm. kind of working under you. And it seems like you work with a lot of people in addition to you training people. It yeah. seems like you have connections with other coaches mm-hmm. that you're collaborative with. Yeah. And then it seems like you also have people under you as well. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, well, how did you kind of get to that point? Like, how did you make a decision? Like, should I? I better start kind of hire, yeah. <laughs> hiring some people. Yeah, well, it was when it was actually at the gym that I was at at American Top Team when I was like man there's a lot of guys that need that like I need to make sure that I'm watching them appropriately and for that I I developed a system and that system I can teach that over to my coaches I have interns now too as well I can teach them they come in every month or every three months and uh, we have guys that can obviously take the the load off of my shoulders a little bit and I have guys that are ex-fighters, so they they know the game, they understand it. So the fighters that come in, even though that they look at me for the programming, look at me for the coaching, that's my son right there. Yeah, yeah. Leo's great. He's not playing around. He <laughs> wants to be a fighter. <laughs> Throwing some bombs, man. He, 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 every day. Super every serious, day. too. He was in a barbershop, and then I seen him around the corner, and he was like shadow boxing. Didn't tell him what to do. He just, just started shadow boxing. Oh, that's great. So I captured that. Um, but yeah, so, and he's growing up in a, good environment with the rest mm-hmm. of the fighters so it's funny but yeah i mean the great thing again like i said i can delegate 
as much as I need to, mm -hmm. to make sure that everybody's getting what they need and what they deserve. You know, you said Florida, and, and Florida doesn't give a damn about Corona right now, but <laughs> you're training all these athletes, right? And uh, are you, did you have to try to take any type of precaution? Did you have to yeah. tell your athletes, hey, I don't want you doing this or this, or are you just like training them? No, I mean, we did, obviously, and we still do take the proper precautions. We're cleaning up every day. We're mm -hmm. making sure that when they step in, we have to take their temperature and everything there. Um, for the most part, these guys are always together. You know, gotcha. we're always together. It's mm -hmm. not like we go and then it's like, you know, I go here and then I go here. They're going to one gym and then they're coming to me, mm -hmm. you know. So, again, we're always together. We know what's going on. They're always getting tested, you know, so I'm always getting tested and uh, making sure that everybody is safe and and we're they don't want to get it. They want to fight. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, they're yeah. they're being extra precaution. Yeah. They're taking extra precaution because they're like, yeah. well, shoot. You know, so it's 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 definitely a I had lot. A, I had a guy that stayed out of the gym for like 10 days before his fight because he was afraid that, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't want to catch it just going mm -hmm. to the store or something. And uh, But he did the smart thing because he was able to fight and win. Mm. He had a first round knockout, so it was good. Ooh, damn. And how big is your space? Because it looks pretty big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now we have uh, 10,000 square feet. Hell yeah. And nice. uh, we're, we're looking to expand to an extra 5,000 square feet where I'm going to put our boxing coach in there together with a wrestling mat. And then again, all of our equipment's going to go in there too as well, which is going to be good. Because then we'll have a space for, we, we train baseball players primarily. I, I work with Mo Vaughn, who's an ex-baseball player, played for the Red Sox. Uh, he's my partner. And uh, so that'll be the baseball side, and then I have the sports performance. Mo Vaughn was pretty big, from what I remember, right? Yeah, he was back there. He, he was yeah. sitting down. Oh, was that him? Balls. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. back there pitching balls to his yeah. son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he but, was pretty. Like from what I remember, he was pretty thick, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah he's he was, I mean, but he's never strength trained. Mm, it or not. Really? Yeah, he never did it. He walked Holy in. Shit. Yeah, he walked into American Top Team. Yeah, so you can pull up a picture. I mean, yeah, he's thick. He's man. a thick dude. Yeah. And he's knocking the balls out. You know, that's one thing. He's a specialist. And it's good to be around other specialists in other fields. You know, I'm mm -hmm. always around fighters. But to be around baseball in that in that perspective, like, I don't really know shit about baseball, yeah. to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. My dad is from Boston. So when I told him, I was like, yeah, I, I work with Mo Vaughn. He's like, get the fuck out of here. Like, yeah, yeah, look at him, man. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, forearms. Do the picture on the neck, the next picture, man. Which one? That the one to the right. This one? That one. Oh, there yeah. it is. Dude. <laughs> never, never left the waist. Never. Get crazy. Yeah. When I see people like this, and I'm just like, they never lift it. And I, yeah. I like, it's just like, God damn, Holy if you <laughs> did. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big dude, man. Yeah. And it's funny because when he came to the gym, like we, I started working with him before we were partners. So mm -hmm. when I started working with him, I didn't know who he was, like I said. And then he told me, and then I asked my dad, and he was like, yeah, man, he's big. And then I was like, oh, he's like Big Poppy before Big Poppy. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And uh, he goes, man, if I would have done this before, I wouldn't have so many injuries and I would have had a longer career. Mm -hmm. And so we still talk about it to the day. And that's why he brought me in and tried to, you know, with all the young kids, we're developing that base, mm -hmm. right? He's like, man, these kids are going to have longevity in the sport because of that strength and conditioning background, because we're understanding how to move efficiently and get that strength built in right from the get go. So, yeah, it's been good, you know, and I think that for me, yeah, here he goes trying to teach me how to hit a baseball. <laughs> well, learning how to, you know, swing a bat and learning how to, you know, throw a ball the way that these guys can. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that there's some crossover between that and what you're trying to do with your hips when you're throwing punches oh, and sure. stuff, right? Yeah, when you're yeah. grappling and It's so funny because we talk about it in this Got to be a lot of parallels to it, right? Yeah, creating that internal torque is very important and then through the transverse plane. God damn. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, he's huge. <laughs> he's great. He's so funny. It's like I would watch his like he 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 throws to his to his son and I just watch his son effortlessly. I mean, yeah. how old is how old is Lee? He's like 9, right? Or is he 8, eight or 9? Yeah. yeah. I would just I'm like look at him and it's like a punch. It's like that turn mm. and just effortless and I'm just like so in awe at I, I mean I, I and baseball was my first love I lo and being a Yankee fan was an easy part of Mo Vaughn having to see him across me mm -hmm. yeah. the Boston Red Sox every day but right. um, but it was but it's I mean talking to him it's like you know he's well, they don't have uh, the they don't have any inhibition at all like their 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 swing is so smooth yeah. you know there's there's yeah. nothing stuck their hips aren't stuck they can just they can rotate really really well they swing like every day. Every day, multiple times throughout yeah. the day. The only thing I would say is the issue. That is, ain't bad. Are you left-handed? Uh, yeah, I'm southpaw. So oh, I was, yeah, it was I, I was, you're doing pretty yeah. good, I think. <laughs> Bro, I, I smashed that shit afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, he was like, "Oh my god, you got it!" <laughs> and he was like, "Yeah, there we go. There's the swing. <laughs> there it is." 
when he told me to, and he and he's good at coaching it because he tells you distribute the weight, mm -hmm. you know, in his own terms, and then from there, he's so funny, you know, rotate through. <laughs> and he Where talks she, like like. Where's he from? Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So he's going over it, and then I was, you know, with the with the the only thing with the baseball players is that I do see is there there is a lot of back issues, a lot of hip issues, mm -hmm. uh, obviously going to be a lot of shoulder issues for the pitchers. So again, we're looking at balancing out the body again, right? And increasing range of motion and increasing the strength and stability of the trunk mm -hmm. is very important. Phil, was he not scared that you would hit the ball at him? Because like I'm looking at where he, like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, if bro, you... they do that shit, and I'm like, I would never do that. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> even the little kids, yeah. like, and they're throwing the balls back and forth, and I'm like, man, one of my guys almost got hit by a baseball, and it was a, it was an intern, so it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but it's he, part of the yeah, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm going over exactly what we would do like it's, you're throwing your backhand same thing mm -hmm. creating that torque and uh when i got that it, it made sense to me mm -hmm. so what else do you have at, at your place because you got a, a batting cage we got four oh, you got yeah, four, got four batting right? cages what yeah. else anything else outside yeah. of well we're looking obviously i'm when we go to the next next room over mm -hmm. which is basically going to drop down the wall and there's five thousand square feet there we have clinicians in there now, so I have a massage therapist, I have a, have a neurokinetic therapist, really. She does PDTR, um, post, was it post tendon something reflex? Per, 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 uh, I don't know, it's crazy. But it, yeah. it's, it looks like voodoo, to be yeah. honest with you. And she can go more into detail, but I would say that that has helped us out a lot, just being able to reference over to those clinicians, and then I can get the assessments that I need to. And then obviously I take them over to Christiana, but we have that, and then we're looking to, I wanna get a sauna in there. I definitely wanna get either, um, either just a cold tub or something along the lines of that. Yeah, I'm not too big into the cryo thing, but we could get that if they need it. A lot of my guys don't like to get into the fucking cold tub, so right. mm -hmm. cryo's a little bit more, you know, better better for them at least. Um, but yeah, we're looking for that. And then again, boxing ring, boxing bags, full gym, and then turf space, and then a mat, and also got a gymnastics guy coming in too as well, two days a week. That's to awesome. work with the guys. That's sick. Wow. Yeah, and this is this open for like anybody, or is it specifically? So right now it's private yeah, only by say. invite. <laughs> um, but I am gonna probably be opening it up to a membership. And again, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, we definitely don't want them inside the ring, fucking around in the ring. So that'll be closed off for the general public. Mm -hmm. But they can hit the bags, you know, according to what she wants them not to hit, we'll go ahead and block those off. Mm -hmm. Cause there's bags that you gotta learn, learn how to hit, you know? And, uh, but after that, pretty much the gym's gonna be open 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Is or, it a wrestling ring? A wrestling ring. <laughs> we, can, we can make that happen too. Probably uh -huh. tighten up the, the yeah, yeah, could, the ropes could, a little bit. Yep, yeah, come off the top rope. That's it. Yeah, Maureen, you said you uh, you worked a little bit with Steffi Cohen, mm -hmm. and obviously seeing how freak of an athlete she is. Yeah. Right. Was yeah. there anything either of you guys noticed when she just started throwing punches? Like, was she like, super powerful? Like, what, what what do you see from Steffi right now? Um, for me, it was more. Um, everybody looks at her right away, like, oh my god, she must be. But it's, it's learning how to snap your punches and mm. how to be explosive with it. And I think the rotation because she's been. In a, in a position with her deadlift in this like tight like we talked about before mm -hmm. where I had issues with tightening my lats and keeping them on hers are like always on because uh. that's what she's used to also um, I had a problem with her stance in the beginning because it was very wide mm -hmm. and which makes sense her strongest position sumo. is a sumo so I said well this is why it can't you don't want that because you're already small so if you're gonna fight and you fight girls that are 125, that was my weight class. Mm -hmm. And I had her spar one of my girls, um, Kessie Estevez, who's been with me for about six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kessie's like, I, what is Kessie, like five, six, five, seven? She's tall. Yeah, yeah she's tall mm -hmm. and, um, and she's long. So I had them work together. But what I love about my girls is that they work with each other. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So yeah, could Steffi come in and just powerfully go through her, but it's about taking the punches. You know, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Mm -hmm. I can quote Mike Tyson. So um, for her, it's more about learning the head movement and learning the rotation. But she's such a humble athlete when she came in. And I tell her all the time, like, I'm so mm -hmm. like, I'm it's it's awesome that you come in here because having the achievements that she's had outside the gym and in everything as, as a female and then coming in and being completely like, OK, like she listens and she applies and she's smart, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so um, having that background of being such a freak athlete, but also her doctor, you know, being a doctor and understanding the recovery and all of that, it makes my job so much easier and and showing her why but it, her understanding like i said with women i said this is why like i see some things that she does i'm like okay try doing it like this and this is why and then she's like okay because if you just tell her just do this and she's like well i'm like because she's supposed to that's not enough it wouldn't be enough for me 
So I tell him like, well, this is why and this is how. And um, but head movement is something that I'm working on the rotation stuff. You know, um, she'll be coming into the gym to work to work more. She came to the track. I mean, mm-hmm. but she's yeah, like got a video of that one. Dude, she's yeah, sprinting, but it's so funny because I see her stuff now. She's like, oh my god, the cardio part of it. Yeah. You know, we did um, two minute rounds. You know, and she sparred uh, with with Kessie, and uh, you know, Kessie, but can say, hey, I felt like you felt too until mm-hmm. I learned how to use my legs and use my movement and yeah. use my reach. So Steffi's coming and she's very tense, mm-hmm. you know, um, but she relaxed and then she started to apply and understand. But I told her, I was like, be proud of yourself. And she is. I was like, because this ain't easy. Mm-hmm. Everybody thinks they make, we make it look easy. But then when you're doing it, it's like, oh, and there's a lot of this going on. Mm-hmm. So if you can maintain, you know, the, the, the thinking and the analytical part of it, um, you know, and, and also with the physical, it's, it's it says a lot. It's a discipline. It's a different kind of discipline. You're not just and it's not disrespect to the moving of the weight. But you're not just lifting weight and putting it down. You know what I mean? And, and doing all that. It's like a multitude of, of movement. Yeah. Yeah. In this video, we have Olympian judo, professional boxers, and a UFC fighter. Mm. As one of my UFC fighters. So she came out to the track, very humble. She's, she's a sweetheart. And she wanted to get some conditioning. And now, right now, we're doing cardiac power work. So it's very high and high, highly intense, I should say. Right? We're 400 meter runs, mm. one to two minute break, trying to get down the track as as fast and as explosive as you can mm-hmm. and repeat that. And I was going to go until I seen a breakdown, whether it be time, right, getting it done, and then their ability to recover. We were getting to about five reps in, right? And I was gonna shut it down on top of the fact that it starts to pour out, well, right? Yeah. It's raining in Florida, that happens, mm-hmm. right? She goes, but, but we said we were gonna do eight. And I was like, you're right, everybody back on the line. So she has that in her, you know, mm-hmm. it was good. She pushed a lot of the guys. And these two guys right here are judo Olympians. One there, damn, right? And the other one, and she outran them in a couple of the of the runs too as well. Shit. But I mean, it was good to see, you know, it was good to see a, a person step out of their comfort zone. My son's trying to get it. <laughs> Almost tripped over Maureen. <laughs> yeah. What distance are those runs you're having? So that's there? 400 meter runs. That's and, a lot. Yeah. And so they're trying to get it done in less than 90 seconds every round. Mm-hmm. And they and they did. Mm-hmm. Everyone did. Um, and then we were resting for two minutes. And I think, like, I see it, like, especially, like, in the, the first lap, you know, if you, and I've done these with, with Phil before, but, like, you know, I learn, I know how to pace myself because I fight 10 rounds. Mm-hmm. So I know my breathing. So I think for, for Angie, Angie and, um, and Steffi, you know, it was a little bit different for them because they got to get to understanding that breath work, you know, so I think that's going to be a big part in her conditioning as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, she's the judo girl there. She's going to Pan Am's in November 20th. So we're working wow. to the Olympics. Yeah. Looks like everybody's working um, let, maybe on a scale of one to 10, maybe at like a, what, a seven or six? It gets to, in about, terms of, it gets to about an eight or a nine. For it, sure. just, it just gets there. Oh, you nothing. feel like you want to yeah. die, for sure. Between those those <laughs> you, you, those two minutes, is it two minute rest you gave us? Two minutes. Yeah, right. that's mm, like two minutes. the fastest two minutes of your life. Mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You either wanna, yeah. You either want to just get it, get back on there to get it over with, or you're like, all right, I need this time. The goal is to push it to max heart rate, right? Get it up to max heart rate, then bring it down as efficiently as possible. You want to get them down to at least 130 beats per minute, mm. and then repeat it. You know, and then we'll see how long they can go. Mm-hmm. If they can go, and then the, and the goal is to increase the reps. So this week, actually today, they're gonna go there and do nine instead of eight. I really think that's interesting too, because I think that bodybuilding is that way a lot. Like mm-hmm. where somebody might do a bodybuilding workout with somebody, and they might say, "Well, that you know, the weight just felt way too light." And it's mm-hmm. like, "Well, that's just the first set." Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. we're gonna do mo- we're gonna do a Multiple. bunch of sets, we're gonna do a bunch of reps, mm-hmm. and we're not gonna rest that long. Mm-hmm. You know, and so. It, yeah. By the time you get to the third, fourth, or fifth set, uh, a lot of times that's that's where that fatigue starts to settle in, and you're contracting the muscle as if you were using a more intense weight. For sure, yeah, yeah. It, it's accumulation of that fatigue is is what's important, and and again, you have to make sure that you can get the optimal amount. Right, we can't go overboard because they have to do other things. Mm. You know, so I was going to shut it down, and then I seen that it was just mental for a lot of them. Mm. Believe it or not, and these guys are high level. You know, so when that little girl that power lifts comes in and the, all these fighters are like, oh, hell no, we're not gonna let this little girl do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, but she, you know, she was able to push these guys, which was cool to see. She definitely has the mentality. And I love that when she comes in with the boxing, you know, but then it's like the same thing. I'm like, right, that's enough for today. Cause the, bot, the mind can only take on so much, mm-hmm. you know? And then it's like, okay. Yeah. 
how's it when somebody does take a boxing at like because she's not like super young she mm -hmm. hasn't been boxing since she was a kid mm -hmm. but have you guys seen people come in like later that don't have that type of experience and progress pretty damn quickly or is it kind of rare I, i've seen i've seen guys and girls that have that athletic background mm -hmm. that's been very i say i would say successful you know you have a great Hardy who's been in the nfl forever who's being successful, he's understanding it a little bit more. They have the work ethic built in, obviously, because they made it to the next level or to the highest level of that particular sport. Yeah. It's the same thing with Steffi, where she has 25 world records. She's the strongest female in the world. So then that, that carries over. I think it has a lot to do with the coaching. I think the coach needs to understand that. I think, you know, for myself, like I said, with Paige, where I looked at her strengths and I saw her strongest suit was her dancing. So I had to figure out how to apply that to her to her boxing. Same thing with Steffi. I'm like, okay, what is her strongest? You know what I mean? Where is she strong? And she's got a lot of power, but now we have to work on speed mm -hmm. and it's gotta be explosive because she didn't really have that before. You know, because she's lifting, she's grinding slow. She's not doing like repetitive speed work like mm -hmm. what we were doing, you know, explosive yeah. power type stuff and, um, and, and the cardio. So uh, knowing that, knowing that's their weakness, but like Phil, I've learned a lot of this. As, I mean, he's made me a better boxing coach because now I understand where she, where, where any of my fighters, where they're weak in, or even like if I'm working alongside Derek because I do it myself, mm. I kind of say, okay, I think this is what he needs to do, or maybe he should go see Phil, or you know, or whatever, because I'm like, oh, I had that issue, or yeah. I've seen this fighter have that issue, and then I saw this, this helped it, you know, or how to apply it. So I think, um, yeah, but there's especially women though, because a lot of women are like, oh my gosh, I wish I could have. Mm. One of my girls. Like I said, Kessie, Kessie's 39 now and she just started boxing. For, she did it for fitness. Mm -hmm. and, and and yeah, I don't know if you saw it. There's a picture on my Instagram of, of her and, and um, Steffi doing a face off. And it's significantly height difference and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not just because Steffi's younger, it's her level. But Kessie, is this like a bucket list thing for her, which I'm like super impressed with because she's like, you know what? I just want to have a fight, like an yeah. amateur fight, yeah. you know? And I said, okay, and I'll match her with the right person where it's another, I don't like to call her a weekend warrior because this girl trains, mm -hmm. but you know, having her come in and she's, I, I'll set her up with another uh, amateur, a girl who wants to do the same thing so they can both experience it together. Mm -hmm. There's obviously gonna be a winner and a loser, but it's like whoever applies what they've learned and how they've learned it, you know, the best. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so for her, you know, coming in at that age and saying like, I want to do this. I'm like, yeah, if you want to do it, you can, but knowing that you're around the right people. And if somebody says, you know, for her, the biggest part was taking a punch and learning how to move her head. Because mm -hmm. I can't be having you do this mm -hmm. or do this. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to learn to move your head or maintain your distance with your jab. So Kessie's learned that, and she doesn't turn away from punches at all yeah. anymore. She's really like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn. Because when you turn away, you're not looking at the person. You're not gonna see anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there's only so much of that you can do. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So how do you work with somebody that comes to you that you know? maybe they're just they naturally have a skill to throw a punch or something but they're still very green but they are fluid but maybe they're just not strong yet how do you approach you know training somebody like that i i just send them to fill first mm -hmm. and i'd get them a foundation in strength and understanding body awareness i would for sure have say you know you'd have to do some strength and conditioning and then um you know coming back to me you know um and then we can work on like i can implement some stuff but I think the partnership between myself and, and a coach like Phil is very important. And the communication, which is what I loved when I started working with Phil, um, I Derek and, and, and Phil talk all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that that communication amongst the team, which it, and now I'm um, you know, working with Eric Pena too with my nutrition. I worked with Melissa DeWeese, who's my best friend. She was my diet coach for a long time. They, I always had people that made sure they all communicated and they all got along and they're all of similar mindset. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's really, the I believe, it's the fighter's responsibility about who you put around you. You can't just say, oh, you do this, you do that, and then there's no talk. Like, I'm like, you're going to end up in a really bad place because I've had that where there was no communication. Again, the boxing coach doesn't talk to the strength coach because he doesn't think that you should be strength training, and I, and mm -hmm. I suffered because of it, mm -hmm. you know, having the old school mentality. But having the, the, the cohesiveness of the team now and how everybody works together, oh, it makes my life so much easier and success is, is inevitable because yeah. they all want, they're all going for the common, the same goal. Mm -hmm. um, earlier, um, you mentioned Lomachenko. Well, you mean Vasil Lomachenko? The that ceiling. camp? Yeah. The ceiling? Yeah. No, I'm curious about this because he talks a lot about like dancing when yep. he was younger. And yep. you see clips of this guy and it's just, it's, it's magic. It's literally like, it, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned that you did salsa. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, did, did, do you think that made a difference for you too in terms of the way you box? Absolutely. 
so for me, I, I noticed right away what my problem was when I started salsa dancing. So I did it. Um, actually, I was raising money for a nonprofit um, mm -hmm. for a transitional living faci facility in a, a non-government funded transitional living facility in, in Oxnard, where I lived in California, where Lomachenko trains. And um, I was so uncomfortable because everybody's like, oh, put this outfit on. And the girls are like, you look great. I'm like, dude, I weigh in to fight a chick. I don't wear this and shake my butt. <laughs> like I was like, so and they're like, but you look awesome. I'm like, yeah, but I don't look, I don't have this body to look good. I do it because there's a purpose for it. So, um, but it helped me really tap into my femininity, I think, a lot more. And also to relax because every time I danced with the guys they were like they'd be like relax I'm like I am relaxed and they're like no you're not and I'm like alright so I had to learn to shake my shoulders and relax so now it's really um, if you saw my my last fight uh, I'm I wore a salsa inspired outfit um, uh, for actually a, a world champion uh, Franchon Cruz she's a world champion now she actually a designer she's really really good and she um, she designed my outfit and uh, it was salsa inspired because she asked me mm. what do you want and I'm like I come out to salsa music and it brings me that joy and that happiness of the, the dancing and I dance in the ring because it's so similar but it helped me a lot with my rhythm and to have fun mm -hmm. to remember to have fun and not to be so like Ur. because you know I have the, the Mexican and as much as that can help with my rhythm <laughs> I got that er uh, and the Irish where I'm like <laughs> I'm gonna bear down I'm just gonna stand here and I'm gonna give you and I'm gonna take and you know yeah, yeah. but the, the salsa kind of relaxed me and helped me relax my shoulders but also and like with Phil's training come back to where I need to be strong and apply you know what we learn and then go back to my dancing Can and I love it how yeah. much she drinks I was like, listen, I did it at a press conference. I said, um, they said, oh, being Mexican Irish, you know, how do you feel about it? I'm like, well, I'll either beat the hell out of you or I'll drink you under the table, <laughs> you know, but I, I chose to fight. So the boxing's um, definitely a part of it. <laughs> nice. So, Phil, so what can you tell us about your boy Dustin? Is that fight happening with McGregor? I haven't heard mm -hmm. from him about it, so I'm not going to 100% okay. say mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, I mean, it's a great fight for him. Yeah. I think it's a way better fight for him than any other fight right now. Um, he's definitely on another level when it comes down to his striking, um, his mental game, you know, his tactics. And he's at another level than he was when he first fought him. So it, it's going to be definitely different. Um, and I know he'll be successful in that fight. I don't know how much how much drive you know i would say connor has right now mm -hmm. i mean he's got a lot of money you know so yeah. at the end of the day you don't get as hungry and i know dustin he just loves to fight so i mean i don't know connor personally but i do know dustin personally and i know that if anybody loves to fight that kid is he's bred to fight like born to do this stuff so we'll see what happens um when he you know sends me a text i've talked to him recently just about my knee and stuff just small talk but he's in Florida now, so we'll see. Nice, yeah, because McGregor was talking about even doing that Dallas Stadium or yeah. Cowboys Stadium. It's like, oh shit. I mean, he's got to make it make it happen with the big boss though first, right? You know, so he can say all that if he wants to. And he and was like, great, you know, talking about his own promotion and stuff too. Yeah, so that's yeah, yeah. That, you know, that's kind of where I was like, ah, okay, maybe not, but yeah. we'll see. Hopefully, yeah. No, I, I think it's a definite fight to make, yeah. especially if you are Dana. You're looking at it like, man, that's a that's a huge payday for everybody. So, and I know that Dustin wanted a little bit more money. He felt disrespected mm -hmm. in a way because he's been with Zufa for over ten years. Mm -hmm. You know, so the kid's been fighting. Man, I, I think he's been fighting since he was 17, 18, and now he's 29, no, he's actually 30. So he's been with the with the company for a long time. You know, I think he's only had, and you count the WEC, that's a long time being that same company. So he just felt like he, he deserved a little bit more money just for being a veteran and giving him tremendous fights over the years, back to back to back, and being successful. Only, you know, only loss we've had in the past five years, or I would say four years, was to arguably the best fighter in the world right now mm -hmm. you know so i think that he deserves that that ability to get more money and and to fight at the highest level maureen i have a, I have a question for you mm -hmm. um after lebron won the championship he's like i want to i want my damn respect that's what he said mm -hmm. right well you're a two-time world champion mm -hmm. um and women's boxing you said it's something that's growing but i feel like I, I assume that right now, when you say you're a two-time world champion to someone, they don't realize what the fuck you're saying until like they think about it like, oh shit, actually, she's a two-time world champion. Do you feel like you're getting the respect you deserve? Or do you feel like there's still there's still just like a, a distance because it's women's boxing? It's funny because Phil and I say this and he's like, you know, you got that chip and you know, and I'm like, and I, and I, I, I say that, but I, I mean, I do, but at the same time, I have to kind of go back to myself and say, you know, I know what I've done. You know, and, and I can't, I don't, 
it's hard to kind of like always like I'm reaching for that. I'm reaching for that. You know, um, it's it's starting to. But you know, what was hard. The Olympics were great for female boxing, but it also hurt women like myself who, um, you know, we have all this experience. But then these Olympians were signed by the promoters and they came first because they were already made and they already had the sponsorships and we had to do it all by ourselves, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know the, the, the veterans. And it's like, I, as much as happy as I am, I'm sitting there, I'm like, but those girls aren't polished. They're coming from the amateurs and they don't have like, and I almost felt like, I mean, they're getting better. Like even like a Clarissa Shields, you know what I mean? I mean, she's getting better, but she's not quite there yet. You know, she can't be because in the amateurs, it's a different game, very mm-hmm. different, you know? So, um, you know, you've got some girls where they're fighting for world titles when they have six fights. I'm like, and then so I feel like it's what it's doing to the public is it's 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 misleading the public and thinking that's what women look like when they fight, and they're missing out on the women like myself because there's a couple of there's a, quite a few of us that are still in it that have so much more skill. Mm. And I'm not knocking those women. Again, people are like, oh, you're hating. I'm like, okay, no, it's fact. It's fact. You can't be that good if you haven't done it for that long. Mm-hmm. So it's like, come on, let's take the experience, take the lessons and apply that, you know? So for me, I take the emotion out of it. I try to anyway, and I try to apply the logic. And it's also just accepting that, you know what? I'm doing this for me. It's about me. And um, I respect myself. I have the respect of my peers. And uh, a lot of people too, even with the TV stuff, like if social media was as big as it is now, when I worked on Million Dollar Baby and I was mm-hmm. all over TV, because I was, I was, People don't know too about. Uh, I was the first female to uh, in over a decade to co-feature a male fight, which was Shane Mosley versus Ricardo Mayorga too. Wow. He put me as his co-feature on pay per view. The last female was Layla Ali, and my, my I'm not I didn't have a father who was you know not to knock Layla because she was in it, and I appreciate what she's done for the women too. But I had to do this on my own. You know what I mean? So for women like myself that got to that level, and I feel sometimes you know I look at it my responsibility, and it's. It's not, I was somebody said, oh, you like to talk about yourself. I'm like, no, I feel like it's a responsibility to educate the public. Cause if I don't educate you on who I am and what I've achieved, you wouldn't come up with these questions. And then I have opportunities on being on, on a podcast like this and then having somebody like Phil who respects me and he sees what goes on behind the scenes. And he's like, you know what? He wants to give me the opportunity to share, you know, for myself. So that, that I think makes me feel more like, you know what? The respect is there. It's my time, and, and I like I said, I have a faith in God. And Jeremiah twenty nine eleven is my life verse, and I just have a firm belief in like He has a purpose for my life because there's no reason I should be in the sport. I should be dead about four times, and I'm here, mm-hmm. you know, for a number of reasons. And I'm here, and I'm like, okay, so I just need to keep. And He's always revealing. God is always revealing things to me, especially coaching, because Phil said to me like, you know, you want to be a coach. I'm like, no, I want to be in the office because I have a business background. I like to use my brain in that way. Yeah, and I want to be in there, and I'm organized and all that. And then next thing I know, I've got like a group of six women that I'm training and I'm like, okay, some want to fight, some just do it because it's more <clears throat> motivation. They're feeling, finding something, they love it. And I get these messages and I'm like, okay, this is what you want me to do. All right, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to deny that. Mm. But, um, but you know, I think it's starting to come along and I believe, you know, what's meant to be will be, I can't put so much focus on, it's got to happen. I got to make it happen because you know what? All I can do is show up mm. every day and give 100% of whatever I have that day. Mm. And that's something that I learned to be in my experiences, to be patient with myself you know, but the hunger is there. Yeah. Because I, I, I will dominate. Like, that's the thing that people don't, don't underestimate me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's another reason why I might be having problems getting some fights. Because um, they see my social media and they're like, this girl doesn't stop. Mm-hmm. And she's getting stronger and she's getting better. And she's, and then the politics play a role. Mm-hmm. And I get it. You know what I mean? And, and it's hard to explain it sometimes because I do have my moments where I'm just like, this is bullshit. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But then I'm just like, you know what? I can't. I don't live my. I don't. I don't live my life for boxing. And everybody's like, "Oh, you got to eat, bleed, breathe, and sleep and shit it." I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, not really. I'm like, that's really not healthy. I mean, my therapist would disagree with that. And what I've learned is that's probably not the best thing to do. You know what I mean? Because actually, it makes me want to box more. The fact that I don't need it, but I choose to do it. Mm-hmm. And I, I fought for a promoter. Um, he actually worked with Evander Holyfield, Moran Muhammad, who actually discovered Manny Pacquiao. Oh. And when he, oh yeah, I got stories for days. But when he met me. He was like, he looked at me, and this is the first time where he looked at my femininity and my and the way that I am, and I don't look like a fighter, and he was like, that's how I know you're special, because you don't need this. Mm-hmm. He's like, I see so many other things that you can do, but you want to do this. That makes me want to put you on. And I fought on Evander Holyfield's undercard at the Alamo Dome in front of a trillion people, like it was huge, mm-hmm. and, um, and I beat a hometown girl out there, 
And it was it was a tough fight. And again, it was if you I mean, I don't know if I have the picture on my Instagram, but there's a girl and she was a big tall, she's very, very tall, you know, very sh- strong um, um, African-American girl standing there. And here I am with my hair blown out, looking super like, you know, like I'm wearing these pink boxer shorts with a with a sports bra. And I'm just like this. I'm like, oh, you have no idea the fight that I have inside of me. You guys were the same weight class. Oh, yeah. 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 We fought. Oh, yeah. Because she was tall. She was tall. She was lean, uh-huh. you know, but she um, but she was tough, very tough. She was probably heavy handed. Uh, Tammy Frank, probably the heavy, the heaviest puncher that I. Yep, there you go, the heaviest puncher that I ever, I ever fought. And there's Murad Muhammad right in the middle, and Evander's there. He's on the stage, and everybody's just looking at us like. And this was when this was in 2006, I think. And um, you know, it, it, if you see my quote, it's not the size of, of the of the the dog in the fight; it's the size of the fight in the dog. Yeah. And everybody looking at me like I'm like you have no idea what's inside of me, and that's what you want. You know, I if you look because I fought girls that were super muscular, super ripped. I'm like. But if they don't know how to throw a punch, they don't have mm-hmm. heart and they don't have this, mm-hmm. you know, and I could tell at the weigh in. I mean, I looked her down like I look through my opponents. I don't look at them. I look through them. And then when I get in the ring and they see how I look in the ring. They're like, is that the same girl? That's and it's almost like an alter ego. But it's yeah. like, no, that's my fight. And it comes out, you know, and, and I love what I do. And, and I still have that in me. And I think I always will. Um, but I, I fight to win. No matter if there's a title or no title, I fight to win and to execute the plan and to make my coaches proud on the work we've done. Yeah, I'll say this. When someone's looking through you, it feels different. Yeah. It feels kind of creepy. <laughs> well, I've seen girls break, you know, at, at, weigh, at weigh-ins where I'm like, oh, okay, I know what kind of fight this is. I don't underestimate anybody, mm-hmm. but I kind of know because they then I get to the weigh-in, the weigh they're looking at me. They turn first, away first. Then we get to the fight and I do the same look when I'm in the middle of the ring. And sometimes they look away, or sometimes they don't look at me. They look down, or sometimes they look right at me, and I'm like, mm-mm. I'm like, okay. Gotcha. I'm like, good. I'm, I'm up for the yeah. I'm, I'm up for the challenge. Let's go. Gotcha, bitch. And then you know, <laughs> yeah. it's over. Yeah. All over. <laughs> but again, it's not personal. Listen, I'm I'm a very loving, compassionate, empathetic person, and I embrace my opponents after every fight, win, lose, or draw. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, I always I have the utmost respect. But when I go in there, you're, you're a target. You know, and and I have to, you know, I'm going to execute what I have to execute and I'm going to win. And I think that's the healthy mentality to have. You know, there's no human. It's not humanistic to me. It's just it's just physical dominance. Yeah. I want to know this because has that, I guess, that mental side of things, did it come natural to you? Because like Israel Adesanya was talking about that with his uh, whole thing with Paulo Costa before the fight. And he Mm -hmm. was talking about how Costa was reacting. And when you hear that, you're like, is this bullshit? But then you see it. You see the clips and you, you. you see exactly what he's talking about, like that girl, the girl turning away from you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did someone like tell you about that, or were you just like, I'm, I know how to break someone mentally? So, I come from the Bronx, mm-hmm. so I got into some fights okay. <laughs> in the Bronx, and um, and in my neighborhood, it was very much about respect. Mm. Um, and you know, I had girls that would challenge me, and I've been in face-offs. I was in a face-off with a female, and you know, her friends were egging her on, and I looked at her, and I was like, Go ahead, hit me. Get yeah, hit me. I don't. I don't encourage this, mm-hmm. but you know, I think that's when I knew because once she hit me, that was it. I mean, I blocked out and I just went after her. Ooh. But I knew I had it, so I definitely was born with a killer instinct. And also, like like I said, that that misplaced rage when I was younger, and I couldn't communicate what I felt, and I didn't have my emotions kind of in check. I would react. I've. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've broken things in my house. I punched walls. Very young. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of issues. I mean, I. I and I. A lot of people are like, man, you're crazy. I'm like, no, I had issues. And I, I used to slam my head against the wall when I was a kid because I couldn't express myself verbally. Mm. So I reacted in physical violence or physical, you know, and learning how to do it in boxing and it be okay to, you don't, you're, you're not, it's not that you're crazy. You know what I'm saying? You just, you know where to apply it and how to apply it. So I think I've always kind of had that inside. I mean, not to say that you can't be a fighter if you don't have that, mm-hmm. but at least if you do have that, understanding that there's a healthy way to, you know, to get that out. You know, calculated and and real, and you can actually make a career out of it. You know, but the balance is so important. The emotional health is so important to understand why, what's triggering. Because you can't, if I get hit in a fight, I can't react off an emotional trigger. Mm. I, I can't like or a physical or emo, emotional trigger. Really, it's like physical, then it's emotional. It's like no, you get hit. It's got to be strategic. I'd be like, all right, I took that. And before a fight, I would read a book. I don't know if any of you've heard of it. Well, you know who Paulo Coelho is. Yeah. Okay, so I read a book called Warrior of the Light. Okay. And I would read it before every fight. Actually, one of the ring announcers came in. He's like, I heard you read before you fight. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, I was an English major, you know, so I, that was that was a big thing for me. And I would read and it would calm my mind down. And Warrior of the Light talks about how a warrior, it's actually strong to retreat. You know, the vulnerabilities to retreat and reassess and then, and then go out again. That it's not that you're weak because, you know, when you, I was always this person, like, go, go, go. But learning how to step back. Yeah, that was my self-inspired outfit. 
you know, I didn't, I didn't actually, you know, I didn't read in this fight, but Phil, you know, Phil saw how calm. I mean, I was happy. Yeah. It's probably the calmest I've ever seen any fighter before a fight, to be honest with you. And I've been around the game for a, for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. A little bit. Um, but she, it was like another day, like honestly. Yeah. And I was like, damn, this is kind of weird almost. Mm -hmm. But I knew that she's a veteran. I knew that she was comfortable in there. She went out there and dominated that girl. Like it wasn't anything. And the good thing is that like with her, you got to, Dustin says this a lot. As a fighter, you have you have to have a special type of crazy, mm -hmm. you know, and that's and that's kind of how you can see like this is fun for for her. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fun for these guys and girls that go in there and, and fight. And if it's not fun, you're not gonna have a great career, you know. Mm -hmm. So you gotta kind of figure that out in the beginning, and you you will if you get in there and actually fight. And mm -hmm. you'll you'll get tested because I did. It stopped being fun for me. And I started getting hit more, and my manager, I stopped, actually my, my stoppages started, and he was like, you're not having fun. I'm like, you're right, yeah. something's gotta change. And it wasn't so much so much about like the trainers, I just knew I needed something, because I know a lot of fighters move trainers and they get slack for it. And I used to be one of those people that gave the fighter, like, you're so not, you're not loyal. But you know, I think if you do it respectfully and you're like, you know what, this is no longer serving me, I've reached a point, I appreciate everything you've done for me, but now I need to move on. And I've had some great coaches throughout my career, and I appreciate them very much, and I've learned from them. You know, and, and I've, I've learned to apply and I've learned to not take things so personal, which is, it's tough, you know, but you're like, okay, you know, I just got to do this for me. It's got to be what's right for me and what serves me. And I think that's where the mental health comes into play and understanding your true self and what your purpose is and not, not trying to get validation from everybody around you, which is what I did for a long time. I felt like, you know, oh, that validates me. This, I know I, I validate me. Like I choose what I want to do. Like I said, I do something called whatever I want. You know what I mean? And that was something that was, people were like, either like, yeah, or they're like, oh, you're one of those. And I'm like, no, it's not that. It's like really, listen, I'm in a sport, which is like, you know, it's really tough and we don't get paid a lot of money. I clearly don't do it for the money, yeah. you know? So for me, I know my why. And I think anybody in anything in life needs to know their why. And then once you discover your why, and then you have a goal, and then it, everything makes sense. Phil, what you doing here? What am I doing? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're uh, helping out my buddy Sean, right? Yeah. And you're um, and with uh, Eric, right? Yeah. So uh, Eric Pena, who is uh, going to do a quick little video about. And uh, she was mentioning that uh, Eric's your coach, right? Yes, Eric does my. Yeah, he, I yeah. just I just started working with Eric. I'm the kind of person that, like you know he he came on. I've known Eric for a long time, and I had Melissa. You know who I worked with for a long time, and um, and again, you know, I said to Melissa, I said, yeah, I'm going to try out Eric because I know he's been working with the fighters in the gym, and in order for me to, I have to experience it in order to talk about it. Otherwise, I can say, oh yeah, Eric's a nice guy. What do you think about his nutrition? I don't know. I don't work yeah. with him. I'm, I'm honest. You know what I mean? I have to be very transparent. So I started working with him, and um, it's been great. It's a good, it's a good change up. You know, him and Melissa are very similar in their approach, but I'll tell you, like. My, 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 I mean, I'm just getting leaner and leaner. And he upped my fat like tremendously for me that I noticed. And, but it's been an adjustment because I don't have a gallbladder. So I had to start taking bio salts. Mm. Yeah. That's a, that's another story. I lost that when I was 17. High yeah. pain tolerance. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I'm a little crazy. Okay. But, um, but that was scary for me with the fat because I was like, oh, am I going to start getting, you know, my ALT went up because I was developing a fatty liver and all this stuff. But I, I'm very much about getting my numbers checked and everything. And I started taking bio salts. So it doesn't really, I'm, I'm good. So now the fat, I'm like, man, I'm getting leaner and I feel good. And, and I think for women too, right? I mean, yeah. uh, high fat diets sometimes are older women, you know, yeah. hormonal. Yeah, right. Hormones, yeah, yeah. yeah and sure. thirty nine. We got some hormone stuff going on. So I mean, it's about it's a good balance. To be honest with you, he he doesn't take it into the extremes mm -hmm. in a, in a sense. And it was a and lot for, for fighters. It's, it's it's important, you know. And so Eric is there working with Sean now. As the Dutch Bros, shout out the Dutch Bros. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Our boy Sean Provost. That's it. And uh, so I actually. Uh, <laughs> Eric got a hold of me because he has spondylolisthesis, which is basically the vertebrae. One vertebrae sits in front of the other, mm. which causes obviously pain, discomfort, and then it can eventually fuse. Ooh. So, and then obviously you'll have from the nerves that are there can get pinched, and then you have nerve damage and some uh, some discomfort when doing things. So with that, it was out of Eric's scope of practice. So he called me up, you know, I've been working with Eric forever now. You know, he actually was one of my interns. Mm. And so now, brought him out there. I got a hold of Sean, talked to him a little bit, and then we went through what I would say, a, a phone call to assess what's going on. Give me some information so that I know I'm not just walking in here blind. The great thing is that again, like I said, my, my wife does have the same issue. So I've been dealing with this for a while. So I went in there to, uh, yesterday, we ran through a, a quick assessment, 
put them through some uh, some basic movement patterns, worked on some stability, enhancing and contracting those muscles that support the back. Mm. And what I've seen was that, yes, he does have an inhibition to contract the glutes and he does have weakness in his hamstrings. So there's some major supporters there. Um, so yesterday we worked on that. I worked on his ability to move and understand how to stay tight in certain positions and also be loose in certain positions. Working on controlled articular rotations of each joint capsule to increase the space, the working space of each joint mm -hmm. so that he can move more efficiently. Then I was just working on his ability to create torque into the ground. So foot strengthening, glute strengthening, core and trunk strengthening, and then mobility of all the other uh, joints that need to be you know, mobile. But from what I've seen, he's he's strong, like definitely strong. He almost pushed my hands like you know, all the way out. But um, but yeah, just little things, you know, taking in to a point the details, which is very important, and being able to understand how to contract those muscles that are going to stabilize the body. And then from there, we're going to get him a belt squat. We're going to get him a reverse hyper. Is he's looking like George Clooney with that hair? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he walked. Dude, you trained George Clooney. I guess so man. Um, is it helpful that he's he Sean's pretty mobile. Is that going to be is that helpful or is that kind of make things worse in the beginning? Um as far as what though? As far as his back. As far as like re rehabilitating the back, would it be better if he was almost stiffer cuz I know he can move like really well. Yeah, he's not bad. He's not bad. I mean, he does have limit limits in internal and external rotation of the hip. So like mm. there's some issues there. He does have a hip shift. Uh, one hip is higher than the other and that that's mm. that's normal for what he has. A little bit of uh, scoliosis build up in the right. T-spine, that's also normal, right? Because again, years of compensating through that particular pattern. So increasing his gait, right. understanding how to move efficiently. Again, like I said, trunk stiffening is gonna be important, right? And I'm talking more so from the lumbar. We stabilizing. Stabilizing the lumbar spine and increasing the mobility of the T-spine. So at the end, we we're working some book openers, working some control articular rotations of the shoulder, uh, just because I do want him to have that mobility of the upper back but also understand how to contract and, and increase his intra-abdominal pressure. Now, another thing is that he has stomach issues in, in some ways, and he also passes, or he also throws up right. during workouts, and you know that because you made him throw up a, a bunch of times, or what I've heard, oh. right? <laughs> so again, increasing his ability to learn how to breathe properly through these patterns, right? Because I, I found think that- that's a reason that that's happening? I think so, breathing? I think so. I, I, think it's, I think it's a diet issue, and I also think it's, it's a breathing issue too as well. So okay. again, maybe trying to brace too hard and not bracing the proper way, Mm -hmm. and then increasing his ability to exhale appropriately in those different positions. He's doing pretty good on some of these exercises, it looks like. Yeah, he's doing well. He's doing well. He did better than I expected, to be he's honest. He's very mentally you. tough, is what I noticed, because we do a lot of these things, and I know how hard they are. And mm -hmm. I was talking to his assistant, Alex, and Alexandra, and I was just like, <clears throat> I feel for him right now, but he's <laughs> he's he's got a lot of, well, you know, I mean, he's got a lot of fortitude. He's very yeah, much absolutely. like, I'm, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get it. That's, and, he, that's, and he does walk a lot. You know, he's 30 minutes, I believe, something mm -hmm. like that. And that's good. That that usually is an indication that there is no no nerve damage to as well. There's nothing going down or shooting down his, his back or his leg. So that's an, that's a good uh, a good thing. And then from there, again, I'm just going to slowly progress him. You know, he's going to go from the ground. He's going to be working primarily stability, strength, mobility, movement patterns, you know, functional movements that are going to enhance other things. And then from there, we can load him with the belt squat we can load him with a reverse hyper i definitely want to do a lot of sled drag variations mm -hmm. you know and then from there as long as we're building up strength in the in the safest manner with the most simplest movement patterns and then we can work on increasing his ability to brace and have that movement control that's going to help him go further on i'm not going to obviously put a barbell on his back for a minute but he's going to do, do these very methodical very monotonous things but it's gonna increase his overall performance down the line and his overall health down the line. Nearly anybody can drag a sled. That's it, right? I, I have kids do that. Mm -hmm. you know, when we start off, I got seven year olds that drag sleds for for distances, and that's that's kind of kind of our like our, our rule of three, right? Louis talks about that a lot. The rule of three he has a book on it. Um, but the old Soviets, they used to have the kids just basically do everything in the gym. You know, walk, run, crawl, climb. <laughs> everything that's going to set up a base of movement quality. So anybody can, yes, pull a sled. Now, you still have to teach them the proper muscles to 
produce force through the ground so that you can move forward because mm -hmm. a lot of guys do it differently and there's different variations so and if, if you I, have like seven plates on there you're leaning forward a lot maybe not 100%. getting your heel into it and it's 100%. starting to train different muscles yeah, you, and stuff like that you, you got to humble yourself a little bit you got to make sure that you back off and make and you know understand heel toe and understand you know moving and producing force through the hamstring and propelling yourself forward with that now that's going to be the upright position now there is some positions that we will go 45 and we will drop through the ground and get some acceleration out of that because these kids especially the athletes i want them to produce force into the ground so that they can produce themselves going forward right mm -hmm. um and then we'll do lateral variations we'll do crossover variations we'll do back pedals you know um, i'm doing a lot of those now um and i'm doing i've done them you know a week out from from surgery because i know that one i'm not gonna hurt myself i have the strength to do it and it's very efficient you know and i can build up the strength there to enhance the other qualities of what i need to do going down the line mm -hmm. so you're helping sean uh physically with the training and then eric's helping with the nutrition right mm -hmm. yeah. and then when you're more remote like when you're not here how do your clients you know when you work with any client remotely how do they how do they know how do they remember the exercise do you have a exercise index on your website yeah. or something like yeah. that yeah i'll have a i have several um so you can go to youtube we have a a basic page there where you can go see all the exercises when i put the program together i'm gonna attach the links mm -hmm. so that they can actually see it then they'll send me over a video then i can break down the video if i see it's if there's a little bit of um compensation there then i'll go ahead and tell them you know what they need to do but it's so easy to forget you're like he said to do the oh, know, you're like yeah. shit man i got it wrong <laughs> exactly and, and I, I honestly don't like doing a whole lot of online coaching because of that and mm. i can't really call it coaching it's online programming i'm giving you some advice there mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean we try to do it as, as much as we can obviously sean's out here i'm in florida but we'll make it work and then we got guys like yourself josh can help out you know and eric can definitely help mm -hmm. out too as well but again, I just want to make sure that he's getting what he needs. And, and if I can do that in a little bit of a time span like that I have here, I'm going to go back tomorrow and, and still solidify some of the movements so that he has it. But again, it's going to take time to understand it. As long as he can put the connection together as far as where he needs to put the force down into the ground, where he needs to properly brace. And there's little things. It's right like when he was doing the, the glute bridges, there was some compensation there where he wasn't paying attention to his lats. He wasn't paying attention to the engagement of pressing down with his big toe, mm. right? So then again, you can't contract the glutes efficiently if you don't squeeze the big toe. So I'll, and that's, those are little things that we have to take care of. But other than that, the movements, he's he's got pretty down pat. Awesome, man. Well, uh, I hope it really works out you know, well for him because uh, I know that that's like one thing that he really wants to kind of nail down is his, is his fitness. Yeah. And uh, I think I originally put him in t contact with George Lockhart, but you guys are all, you together. guys all work, work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. I mean, George, me and George have been working together longer than Eric has been working with me. Um, George worked with Yoni and Jay checked us in Poirier, so we've always had that connection. Cool. Yeah, it was good. Andrew, want to take us on out of here? I will. Uh, thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode, especially those of you on the uh, on the live stream. It was really cool seeing you guys real bright and early on the West Coast. Um, uh, thank you to Free Sleeve for sponsoring today's episode. Uh, head over to freesleeve.com. Use code uh, POWER25 for 25% off your order. And uh, please make sure you're following the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project. And actually, something happened in the last three consecutive episodes that has never happened before on the podcast. When I put when I put this post up, I want somebody to guess what it is or get the answer right, and I'll send you something from Slingshot. You don't even have to pay for it, Mark. I'll do it. <laughs> if somebody can get it by the end of Friday, this episode goes up on Monday. Whatever it is, that unique thing that happened, if you guys can hit me up first, I'll send you something dope. Uh, anyways, please make sure to follow the podcast at mm. MB Power Project on Twitter, and my Instagram is at I am Andrew Z and Sima. Where are you at? And Sima Inyang on Instagram and YouTube, and Sima Yinyang on Twitter. Mark. Where can people follow along for you guys? Um, at, at Maureen Shea, at Maureen underscore Shea on Instagram and uh, Facebook is Maureen Shea, Twitter and Maureen Shea. Daru Strong on Instagram and Twitter and DaruStrong.com. Check out my website and the YouTube channel, Phil Daru Strong. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never a strength. Catch you all later.